joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. You better not, because he's been good. There's joy here. Our God is surely in this place. There's no question about it. We shout out your praise. Hallelujah, God. We shout it out, shout it out. He's been good, he's been good, he's been good. He's been good, he's been good, he's been good. All the time, he's been good, he's been good. He's been good, he's been good, he's been good. He's been good, he's been good, he's been good. He's been good, he's been good, he's been good. He's been good, he's been good, he's been good. He's been good, he's been good, he's been good.
deceivers come, cause your word will come. This one.
it, you got it. You got it, you got it. You got it, you got it. Receive it, receive it. Receive it, receive it. Receive it, receive it. You got it, you got it. Come on, release the praise. Why? Because one can put a thousand. Oh, but two ten thousand. And it's more than two. Sanctified, holy.
Bible declares none shall come nigh your dwelling. I got it, I got it. I got it, I got it. I got it, I got it. I I received it by faith. Before you take your seat, since you're still standing, just welcome your neighbor. Say you're welcome into the house of the Lord this morning. We are grateful that you are here with us this morning. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Say, give someone a smile. Give someone a hug before you sit down. Share some love. Share the love. Share the love. Come on. Share some love. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Come on, say welcome to someone else. Say hello to someone else. Bonjour. Ask someone what language they speak and say hello to them in that language. Amen. Amen, 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 amen. Hallelujah. Woo! 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 Let's join the house of the Lord this morning. Hallelujah. Amen. Ah. Oh. I'm so glad to be in the house of the Lord this morning, and it's a privilege to stand before you this morning and to welcome you to this women's conference, Train Our Hands to War. Amen. How many of you have been blessed so far? You've been blessed. Blessed so far? Just wave unto the Lord. Give the praise offering unto the Lord. Shout unto the Lord. He has been good to us. Amen. Amen. Well, on behalf of Apostle and all the leadership, I just want to say welcome to the family. We love you, and we are glad that you took the opportunity this morning to join us. You could have been anywhere else, but you chose to join us, and we are so glad. Why don't you just give the Lord a shout and a clap? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Are there any first timers with us this morning? We don't want to just embarrass you. Just wave your hands if you're here. Show them some love. You're welcome to the family. We're so glad that you're here with us. We're so glad that you're fellowshipping with us. And then everyone else, you're welcome. Just give a wave unto the Lord. Hallelujah. There should be a connect card in front of the seat where you sit. And if you just fill that out, we want to connect with you. We won't harass you. We just want to love on you. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So, this conference is based on Psalm 144 verse 1 that says train our hands to war and the Lord has been training our hands through this whole period hallelujah we started out with apostle on Thursday right and then we went to pastor Kim Owens yesterday I mean come on come on We're stepping up and we are being fulfilled by destiny. Destiny is living in us and we are growing. Hallelujah. Amen. And we're just soaring higher and higher and higher. Oh, Lord, we just bless your holy name. I'm just open and available to receive more from Dr. Sharon Nesbitt this morning. Hallelujah. Somebody shout unto the Lord. Amen. Oh, my God. Father, we just want to say thank you. We declare and we decree your grace, your blessings over us this morning and this house. You have been good and you have been faithful to us, oh, Lord. We just want to say thank you for this house of hope, this house of healing, this house of freedom. Amen. The mission of this church is built on Matthew 12, 21, which says, In his name, the nations shall put their hope. And we serve the living God of hope. Hallelujah. And we are a people upheld by hope. Right here, we turn hearts to God and each other. 
We develop people's God-given potentials in order to win in every area of our lives. And we advance God's kingdom through our circle of influence. Amen. So we are training our hands to be able to do this. Because every opportunity the Lord gives us is not wasted. It's an opportunity for him to do his greatness and his goodness through us, oh Lord. Amen. So my name is Nana Mills. And I'm humbled and I'm blessed to serve as one of the LifeNet leaders in this ministry. The Women's LifeNet Ministry. Anyone in the LifeNet? Any LifeNet members? Right, so you can see all the hands that are waved. If you're not part of a LifeNet, I want to encourage you this morning. Make the decision to join us and you will not regret it. There is life in the boat and we do life together. Amen. So if you want to join the LifeNet or want to know more about LifeNet, you can see me or any of the people who... Please wave your hands again. Let them see you. Amen. Hallelujah. And I serve another, the leadership of our great life net pastors. That's Pastor Carl, Pastor Carl Hayes and Pastor Thelma Hayes. I think I saw Pastor Thelma. Is she here? Wave on to her. Amen. We just thank you, Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. And I would like to us to do this as well. Give honor to whom honor is due. Please stand on your feet as we just give a loud shout offering unto Apostle Michelle. Come on. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on, come on, come on. Lord, we bless you for the woman of God. Hallelujah. And as you're clapping up for all the leaders, all the pastors, all the elders, all the deacons, we appreciate you. The dream team, the media, the choir, we appreciate you. Amen. Hallelujah. So it's offering time. It's offering time. It's another opportunity to sow into the kingdom. Come on. Hallelujah. Because your seed will make room for you. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There are many ways to give in this house. You can go to our website. And that's the hopeconnection.org and click on give. And secondly, if you're writing a check, you can make it payable to Hope Christian Church. And you can mail the church. You can make... <clears throat> You can mail the check to Hope Christian Church. That's P.O. Box 505, College Park, Maryland, 20741. I repeat that. You can mail your check to Hope Christian Church. And that's P.O. Box 505 in College Park, Maryland, 20741. And thirdly, if you have your cell phone, you can just text HCC Give to 77. 977. I repeat that again. Text HCC Give to 77977. And if you have your phones, there should be a QR code that you can scan for more information as well. Amen. So thank you for your commitment to generosity. Amen. So I'll just pray over the offering and then you, those in here, you'll be released to give. Amen. So Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we just want to say thank you this morning for another opportunity to sow into your kingdom. For another opportunity, Lord, for our seed to make room for us. For our seed to be sowed, Lord, in this fertile ground to go and then bring back, oh Lord, a hundredfold, a thousandfold, oh Lord. Things, oh Lord, that we don't even expect. Doors that we need to be opened upon us, oh Lord. Our seed shall work for us and it shall speak for us in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Those in here, you are released to come forward and give into the offering baskets. Amen. Come on, come on, come on. Amen. We just bless you, Lord. We bless you, Lord. So give for the conference. If you have your tithes as well, you can sow now. Amen. Amen. We bless you, O oh Lord. Amen. Step aside while we have the announcement. Hello, Hope. Here are your weekly announcements. Have you ever wondered if God desires to speak to you? Receive the answers for this and more at Prophetic Training Part 3, Ministering by Faith, on June the 2nd and 3rd. Instruction materials and lunch are $37. Sign up to save your spot today. Send in place students, please register with your special link. Men, 
Come out and join us for our Kingsmen Fellowship on Saturday, June the 10th at 10 a.m. Bring a friend. Are you ready to go higher? Surge 2023 service returns Sunday, July 30th at 6 p.m. with special guest speaker, Apostle Sharon Parks. Ladies, join us for Coffee and Friends on Saturday, June the 17th for Father-Daughter Time and Bishop J. Allen Neal and our own Apostle Michelle. Fellowship begins at 9 a.m. and 10 a.m. The stream will begin. We invite you to join us in person and online. Then as we honor fathers on June 18th, Bishop J. Allen Neal will stay with us for our 10 a.m. service. We encourage you to not only invite and bring your fathers and father figures to service, but use this as an evangelistic opportunity to reach the people in your sphere of influence. River Conference 2024 registration is open. If you register before September 1st, 2023, you will receive a Release the River t-shirt as a gift while supplies last. Registration is $50. And as a special limited offer, Release the River t-shirts will be available during the Women's Conference at the bookstore for $25. Get all your HCC info directly by downloading our church app. Just search Hope Christian Church MD. For all the events here at Hope, register at the church website thehopeconnection.org. Amen. I'd like to welcome our online audience as well. If you're worshiping with us online, you can type in the city and the state as well that you're worshiping with us. And people in here, is anyone from D.C.? Shout out. Anyone from Maryland here? From Virginia? Where else? Shout out to me. Where's the furthest place you've come from? Michigan, woo! Someone give her a clap. Anyone else? Texas, welcome, ma'am. Thank you for joining us. Anyone else? North Carolina, woo! Come on. Amen. Anyone else? Okay, anyone else who's here who's a child of God, wave your hands. Amen. Amen. Woo! Right now we're ready. We're ready. Get ready, get ready, get ready. Is someone ready? Is someone ready? Are you ready? Get excited. Shout out to the Lord. Woo! Right, so it's an honor for me to do this. Amen. To introduce our speaker for this afternoon. So Dr. Sharon Arnesbet is simply a lover of God and a lover of people. While serving as a coveted spiritual leader, author, philanthropist, and humanitarian, Dr. Nesbitt has founded several works to include Dominion World Outreach Ministries, which is located in Marion, Kansas. Dominion World Development Corporation and Dominion World Guatemala. Additionally, Dr. Nesmith's entrepreneurial anointing has led and directed the acquisition, purchase, and development of land and facilities on behalf of the ministry. Wow. The most recent purchase, a 102 acres of land. Amen. <laughs> which will house the new Dominion campus. These efforts, along with her integral character and parallel leadership and decades of dedication to teaching spiritual truths, has led to her being honored with several prestigious awards to include the Presidential Lifetime Achievement and Volunteer Service Award. Come on, shout unto the Lord for the life of the woman of God. Amen. Wow. As well as being appointed Goodwill Ambassador for the Golden Rule, under the Interfaith Peace Building Initiative. Wow, Dr. Nesbitt's personal passion is to see people move beyond cultural and social economic barriers and flow in their God-given purpose. Wow. And she travels domestically and internationally, ministering across racial and denominational boundaries. Dr. Nesbitt continues to sow seeds that will produce a harvest of transformation for generations to come. Why don't you stand up on your feet as we welcome the woman of God. Come on, give a shout. You're welcome, woman of God. Put those hands together for the Lord. Come on. The Lord is faithful and mighty, amazing and awesome. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank him for his awesomeness and his grace. Amen. 
While you're standing, can you put your hands together again for our apostle? Amen. Jackson. Amen. What an amazing gift to the body. Amen. We so appreciate God. It's so honored and godly proud of the work that God is doing through her and the staff and all of you here in Hope. Amen. That God is doing something supernatural and your, your destiny is alive and it's growing. Amen. And um, God is doing amazing things. Put your hands together. It's not easy. Leading a people. Hallelujah. You know, Apostle, a lot of people was like, if I was in your position, I would do this and I would do that. I'm not just say you're not. So, you know. <laughs> okay. Amen. That went a long way. So uh, we appreciate the gift. Amen. The legacy that was left that God is doing. And that she's is still extending the faith and the love and the passion that our mother and father uh, already established and keep continuing to do it. And all of the staff that is here, we thank you. And all the women that are here, amen. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, something is su supernatural. Something supernatural is happening to you now. Now turn to somebody else and say something supernatural is happening to you now. Now, the Bible says that you can decree a thing, and it can be established. And whether you believe it or not, you just decreed it, and it's being established in another realm. So I think you need to turn to somebody else and say, something supernatural is happening to you now. Hallelujah. Now shout because it is. I say shout because it is. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You may be seated in the presence of the Almighty. Be seated in a heavenly place. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. It is our honor to be here and to stand before you. We're in a great season in God, a mighty season in God. We know all the chaos that's going on, but I think God has us just where he wants us, position and posture to walk in power and authority and watch him do phenomenal things through us. This is the season of empowerment. What an amazing word last night with Pastor Kim. Amen. <laughs> Heard Apostle Jackson, she brought it in Thursday, amen, and had y'all all out. Um, so uh, I'm in uh, tall cotton, as we say in the South, amen. That means I've got to bring it, amen. <laughs> and uh, amen, hallelujah. And uh, we just released the Holy Spirit to do whatever Holy Spirit wants to do. And my assignment, amen, is to bring you into a different dimension and realm as we ascend into the things of God. We just came out of the season of ascension. We came out of Passover, which you call the resurrection, and uh, he walked on the earth for 40 days. Uh, the Bible says that he transvers walked on the earth for 40 days after he got out the grave. Can you imagine that, that somebody has been dead for three days and he gets up and then you see him walking and talking and uh, revealing truth? That would scare half of you anyway, amen. Uh, you would run. You wouldn't do it. It's coming. It's coming. It's coming. Now, if God's going to teach our hands to war, our fingers to fight, and all of this, we've got to understand that technology is changing. Just like earthly technology is changing, spiritual technologies are changing. The what we did last year won't work this year. Every technology is changing so fast, by the time you buy that computer, it is obsolete. So what you learn in January is shifted already. Okay, y'all got, got, got hearing me. Because technology is moving so fast, every morning you're going to have to get up and ask God, what is the method or the strategy for today? 
And so as we are moving into learning technology, methodology, strategies, frequencies, and vibration, old things that the kingdom exists of that we have not engaged as the church because we thought they were new age. They're not new age, they're just new revelation. It is revelation that the church refused to use because we didn't want to ascend. And in our ascended place, we've got to understand all of these tools must be used to bring things to the earth realm. We are not trying to go up. We are trying to come down. The Bible says in Ephesians, we're going to go to 1 Samuel here in a minute, but in Ephesians 2, the Bible says that we are seated in heavenly places. Didn't your Bible say that? Your Bible says in Ephesians 2, 6, that we are seated. He made us to sit together in heavenly places. So our rulership is in heavenly places, and we're trying to enforce that rulership in the earth. So the methodology has to change that we want to go up. We're already up. We need to come down. Why? Because what's in the heavens we need in the earth. God is not so interested in you coming to heaven. He's wanting you to come to the earth and to rule with what he has in the heavens. God doesn't get a whole lot of glory out of you dying, going to heaven. He gets more glory out of you staying here and ruling and reigning and taking authority. So don't be so anxious to get out of here. Be anxious to see what right you can wrong and what order you can bring to the chaos. What justice you can bring to injustice. What healing you can bring to any disease. Come on, demon side. What peace you can bring to chaos and confusion. What can you do while you're here to enforce the rule of heaven in the earth? Not excited that you're going to die and get a robe. No, I'm blood stained. I'm battered. I'm bruised. Come on, because I've been on the battleground. I'm a warrior. Come on, Cam. Yeah, I don't like this kind of preaching. I'm a warrior, and I've been through some stuff. But the Bible says that we're victorious. We're triumphant. We're overcomers. And if you don't engage, you don't overcome. And so I thought, as you all had this title, this theme, I'm like, oh, wow. They're understanding. They're moving into a place now where you're going to engage spiritual algorithms and atmospheres that's going to shift the whole, the whole measure of who you are. So now we're taking personal responsibility for where we are. Oh, I, I said now we're taking personal responsibility for where we are. We can't, we can't blame the church. We can't blame leadership. We can't blame the apostle. You have to take personal responsibility for where you are if you're going to engage. The Bible says we are many members but one body. That means as a member of the body, you can't shrink on your responsibility else the body will be handicapped. Are you hearing me? Say, I have a personal responsibility to war with the gift God has given me. Come on, the foot can't be always depressed because then it minimizes our speed. If you're the foot, you can't always be depressed. Why? We got we to gotta wait on you. We limping now because you're not holding up your end of the box. If the hand is always confused and needs somebody, if you're part of the hand and you're always grumbling and complaining, we can't adequately, come on, fight because you're not there. Leadership is the head and you're the body. And if you shrink your role, then the church as the ecclesia, as the bride of Christ, cannot be all that she needs to be because we've got some areas that are lacking. And then you want to blame the foot. Let's get to my sermon. That's not it. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. 1 Samuel 19. 1 Samuel 19 and verse 18. 1 Samuel 19, 18. I, I want to talk about governing. 
to govern, to govern where you are, who you are, a governing principle, understanding how to govern, establishing a governing spiritual atmosphere. Establishing a governing spiritual atmosphere. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be amazing how you're going to dissect your life and live from the concepts that you're going to rule and reign and govern what God has given you. So this conference does nothing else is to pull you out of your timidity. Because if you're gonna if you're gonna be taught technologies how to fight, you can't be scared. You know, any, anybody scary fighter? Anybody didn't want to fight when they were growing up? Anybody didn't didn't want to you didn't, you didn't want to fight? You didn't want to fight? Come on! Sometimes we tend to bring that attitude in the body of Christ is that we don't want to fight. We just think everything should just be you know hunky dory, okay, and everybody should like us. But you're in a violent kingdom. When you entered into this kingdom, the Bible says that the kingdom of heaven suffered violence. And the violent men and women will seize it by force. That means you cannot be scary in this kingdom. Matter of fact, he says in Timothy, I didn't give you a spirit of fear or timidity, but of power, love, and a sound mind. And so you've got to understand that if you're going to get anything in this kingdom, you've got to fight. It ain't coming easy. Let me tell you. It's not going to rain down out of heaven. God not just going to automatically give it to you. If it did, your prayers would have been answered by now. You got to war for what you want. You got to go in the realm of the spirit. It's going to get ugly. It may get crazy. You might cry. You might scrape your knee. But it's okay. I'm on a battlefield. I didn't come to a fashion show. I came with my sword. I came with a word. I came with a decree. I came with my prayer. Say your neighbor, say back up. First Samuel 19 verse 18. So David fled and escaped and came to Samuel to Ramah. And he told him that Saul, what Saul had done to him. And he and Samuel went and dwelt at Nabal. And it was told Saul uh, saying, behold, David is in Ramah. And Saul sent messengers to take David. And when they saw the company of prophets prophesying, I want you to underline that when they saw the company of prophets prophesying and Samuel standing as appointed over them, the spirit of God was upon the messengers of Saul. What happened was when, because as you read this, it looks like it minimizes the power of transition and transfer. That means Saul now is after David and he's sending men to get David. But the Bible says when he gets to Ramah, which is the word, when he gets to Ramah, the prophets are prophesying. And the Bible says that the spirit of God that was on the prophets got on on Saul's men and they start prophesying. Instead of taking David hostage, they got turned. (laughs) Are you hearing me? And the Bible says, and when it was told Saul, he sent another messenger. And they prophesied likewise. And Saul sent again the third time. He sent the enemy a third time to get David. And guess what happened? What was in that atmosphere got on the enemy. And instead of trying to take them hostage or curse him, they start prophesying. Somebody going to get it in a minute. And then he also walked to Ramah, verse 22, and came to a great well. And he asked them and says, where is Samuel and David? And they said, he's in Ramah. And he went there in Ramah. And the Spirit of God was on him also. And he went on and prophesied till he came to Ramah. And he stripped his clothes off. Because Saul sent three company of 
armies to get David and all of them turned into prophets. And Saul said, wait a minute, let me go. And the Bible says, where is David and Samuel? And the Bible says that he began to prophesy also. And he stripped off his clothes and prophesied before Samuel in like manner and lay down naked all day and all night. <laughs> Building a spiritual atmosphere. That will control what comes into your atmosphere. They had so built a prophetic atmosphere that anybody entered that atmosphere, they started immediately prophesying. What am I saying? God is asking you, can you build an atmosphere where poverty can't get in? Can you build an atmosphere where sickness can't get in? Can you build an atmosphere? It is not going to come automatically. You got to build an atmosphere. Everybody that came to Ramah began to prophesy. Why? Because Samuel had already built an atmosphere that whoever comes into this territory will be turned. The Bible says in, in Samuel 10 that the Bible says in 1 Samuel 10 that David, that Saul, before Saul is perverted, that Samuel tell him, he says, you're looking for your daddy's donkeys. See, Saul operated in a technology and an atmosphere that anybody that come into his atmosphere had to prophesy. He says, go look for your donkeys. You will find a company of prophets. And the Bible says that when, when Saul got there, he was turned. And begin to prophesy. Samuel carried a technology that anybody came in his atmosphere was changed. Somebody gonna get it. That's why people always gravitate to you because whatever they're carrying, they want to capture you or hold you hostage because they see you ascending and they're like crabs in a barrel. They don't want you to go far. So you got to watch who comes into your territory. Don't be so anxious to have friends that you don't look at what they're carrying. Hallelujah. And so if we're going to govern, the word govern means to rule over by right of authority. It means to exercise a directing or restraining influence over a guide, over a territory, or over a people. To hold in check. Say to hold in check. <laughs> no, no, no. You got to hold it in check. No, 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 no. Sometimes you got to draw a bloodline. Say, hell no. Oh, okay, okay. So, so we're, we're, we're so liberal now. We're so loosey-goosey now that we want to love everything and everybody. But we've got to put some restrictions and some boundaries and some territories and some limitations around us. That these things, you've got to put a no-fly zone over your head. Are you hearing me? Come on. The Bible says <laughs> that the arrows might fly and the pestilence may come. But it shall not come nigh my dwelling place because I have created a spiritual atmosphere that will govern what goes on in my life it is to control I said it is to control that, that anything that tries to come in your life you restrict it and refuse it or you create such an atmosphere that the curse turns into a blessing. The technology is changing that we don't have to war so much with the principalities and the powers. Hear me. They are still there. But you've got to build an atmosphere that even if they come, it is a blessing. By the time they hit the atmosphere I created, whatever they brought, it cannot manifest because I put restrictions in the realm of the spirit. 
You remember Daniel? Daniel 10, the Bible says Daniel is praying about a prophecy. You know, when you get a prophecy, you just can't put it on the shelf and say, we're going to wait to see if the prophet was right. No, the Bible says you got to war with it. Why? Because everything is spiritual. Shout spiritual. Everything. Now, you can be carnal if you want to. The Bible says spiritual things belong to the spiritual. Carnal things belong to the carnal. If you want to be carnal, be carnal. Everything is not spiritual. Everything is spiritual. Why? Because we live in a world that is spiritual. Are you hearing me? It's slowed down so it can manifest to the optics of your eye. But everything is moving at the speed of light. And because we're in a lower dimension, of this third dimensional plane and we have eyes it has been dilated and slowed down so you can see it but if you get above earth atmosphere things start moving exponentially at the speed of light and you need an extra pair of eyes to see it why because things have been speeding up it's only when it gets to the atmosphere it slows down you know when a rocket is shot up it needs help to go up why because this Gravity pulls it back down. It's called the law of gravity. But when it is above earth atmosphere, no more pull. If you keep ascending, if you keep going up, if you don't let anything or anybody pull you back down, You'll start seeing things, accessing the realm of the heaven. You'll start going beyond, come on, being human and being divine and taking your divinity and sitting in your seat of royalty and being in your heavenly places and rule from above. The Bible says, Daniel, he says, from the first day you prayed, Daniel, he says, I heard your words. The angel came and talked to Daniel. Today, I believe there's going to be activated in your system an ability to engage with the angelic. Now, we can't win this battle without the angels. He says, I'll give you angels that will have charge over you. Are you hearing me? And so that dimension of the angelic, you're going to have to start engaging, asking God to open your eyes, to let you see, let you hear. Are you hearing me? Why? Because the technology warned us to engage this realm. The Bible says in Hebrews 1 that they are called and sent to those that are heirs to salvation. Angels are sent to help us. But because we are in so much fear, we're like, God, I want to see it. I want to see it. No, no, no. I want to see every one of them. I want to experience every one of them. I want to engage every one of them. Because if one come to me and say, Sharon, from the first day you prayed, we heard you and we were coming for you. But when we got over Persia, the atmosphere was contaminated. Do you see now? It is important for you to build a spirit to an atmosphere that angels can bring the answer from heaven to. You've got to build a spiritual atmosphere where the engagement from another dimension can happen in your life. Come on here. Well, I don't understand all that. No, I don't understand all of it either, but I receive it and I believe it because I got enough Holy Ghost in me. Well, what if you tap into the demonic? You've already tapped into the demonic. We're in the demonic. This world is fallen. Are you hearing me? I want to tap into the angelic. I want to step into realms and dimensions that we've never seen. I want to bring healing back. I want to bring deliverance back. I want to bring lungs back. I want to bring a kidney back. I want to bring back healing, miracles, salvation, restoration, multiplication. He said, I got over your region. And he says, I had to war. Now, isn't it amazing? The Bible says that the angel was stuck there warring with a principality. That God had given them the answer from heaven. But because of the contamination over Persia, the angel could not break through or bring the manifestation. 
That means you just can't say, well, God, I'm gonna... you got to pray it all the way through. Yeah. Yeah. We have taken prayer and fasting declaration so casually because we are automatic pilot. We get up, go to work, come back home, get to work, and then like, God don't work. You know, this is the most embarrassing, one of the most embarrassing generations because we have left our first love. And that's why Christians are burning sage, trying to open things. They sh- Because they don't see no manifestation in the church. And we ain't taught people how to walk in the power and the spirit. And how to have the hushkanama halivin gadaba. Ila monkuna le menketetu mashai. Ikakola vankia lava. Thank you, Holy Ghost. So I wouldn't say nothing wrong. And we don't don't have enough confidence in the Holy Ghost in us. I said we don't have enough confidence in the Holy Ghost in us. We just, we got a little cute tongue. But when the Holy Ghost wakes you up and start decreeing things and open your eyes to see things and to hear things. We want to stay safe. So the pandemic exposed those who had religion. Versus those who wanted a relationship. Everything about the church has changed. Matter of fact, we're not even in the church age. We're in the kingdom. That's why church stuff don't work. That's why folk that don't want to be in the kingdom won't last long. That you might have to worship for three hours. That we take the limitations off of God. I was standing there so excited because I see a level of freedom here. Are you hearing me? And even if the clock goes off kilter, they add more time to say we're going to be led by the Holy. We're going to be led by the Holy Ghost. And it may take three hours for that cancer to get out of the body. It may take four hours of us lying prostrate, praying in the Holy Ghost for that thing to come out. We may have to pray all night until your son comes out of that addiction. So we're going we're gonna to create an atmosphere that right here at Hope, right here at Hope, when somebody hit this altar, something happened. And so don't get mad at others if they're lying out, they're prostrate, they're praying while she's preaching, they're fasting, and you sitting there to my, they just want to be seen. Yeah, they want to be seen in the heavens. They don't care about what you think about them. They don't care if they got to run around the church 15 times and you look at them crazy. They don't care if they get a little fanatical. Tell your neighbor, I'm building something. I'm building something. Don't mess with me. It's like the man by Bartimaeus. He was crying, Jesus, the son of David, have mercy on me. You got your eyesight. He's blind. He needs him to stop by. And whatever it takes... Because your neighbor say whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. See, you don't know what's coming down the pipeline. And so if he say fast for seven days, if he say fast for four months, if he say fast for six months, if he say fast for the whole year, I'm averting something that's coming. Something that is coming and something that God needs in the earth needs my participation.
There was a man flying on a plane and a pastor was sitting beside him. I don't know if I told the story. And uh, he was moving his mouth like he praying in tongues. And the pastor was so excited because they had a 14-hour flight. And he was like, man, I'm beside a believer. We can engage and we can talk about all of the things we need to talk about. And we can pray in tongues while we're flying and all of this. And he touched over. He said, hey, sir. He said, yes. He said, I see you're a believer. He said, I never. He said, I practice white magic. He praying in tongues. He said, I have been presented the opportunity to get this certain power. And he said, I have to fast for a year. And at certain times, I have to pray. I would appreciate it if you don't bother me the rest of the trip. No, you missed it. We want power, power, Lord, power, power. You don't do nothing with what you got. Behold, I give you power to tread on serpents, scorpions, and all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Luke 10, 19. But what's fascinating, apostle, is this man was fasting a whole year to receive a power. And we can't fast three days. We don't know how to create this atmosphere. So Daniel, 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 angel said, uh, I got over your area, I got over your house, I got over your workplace, I got over your bank account, I got over your children, I, I got over your marriage, and I couldn't, I couldn't come through. Because the enemy had so constructed an atmosphere, I couldn't break through. That's why your prayers ain't helping. Because there's an atmosphere over that thing that your little prayer ain't breaking through. You may have to add some fasting, some all-night prayers, some decrees. You may have to sow a seed. These are all technologies on just not your physical hands how to fight, but spiritual hands how to fight that my hand may be fasting. My fingers may be giving. And it's... It ain't talking about physical hands and fingers. It's spiritual. It may be fasting on the little ring. It may be, come on, loving somebody, forgiving somebody. It may give. It may be the sacrifice of fasting and prayer. You sit back and you ask Holy Spirit, okay, how are we going to break this open? You don't, you don't, you're not conceited to think. You can do a little robot tie my bow tie and that's it. We were believing for 20. We needed some money to finish the parking lot. And by the way, we've broken ground on our new facility. So, amen. Took some time, but we had to break. We had to get the atmosphere. Yeah. Atmosphere one, right? Atmosphere one. You know, you don't just up and do things in the kingdom. You got to build an atmosphere. And that's, we don't want to work. We don't want to work. Are you hearing me? We're lazy. So we're, we're not concerned. So we needed a, a little money. And uh, I, I was asking the Lord, what he, and then, you know, first thing we do is we run the prayer. Every enemy holding my thunder. We command him at cool. The Holy Ghost says, shut up. That's not the technology for this breakthrough. See how we, how we think. We, we feel with the Holy Ghost. We do pray in tongues. And everything is about prayer. Be, 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 be. Holy Ghost say, run. Run. I need this money. I'm like engaging the spiritual dimension. He said, run. I said, run. Okay, I'm running. A couple times around. Yeah, thank you. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Keep running. Ten times around our church. Turn my hand. Run. Turn my mind. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Is that enough? 
I'm, and then I go back to on the altar. He says, shut up. Get up and run. Okay. That's against my training. Because we pray about everything, right? Or I say we pray. <laughs> run. 15 laps around there. Oh, bah, bah, bah. <sighs> 19 lap. <sighs> I know, I know y'all all in shape and y'all yeah, running around here 19 times. Uh, <sighs> I'd already tell the staff, don't disturb me. I'm engaging. I'm, I'm going to see what spiritual dimension is holding up the melody, all this. And all of a sudden, knock on the door. And I'm like, I told him don't bother me. Because I'm thinking, I, I got to get back to the altar and pray. All right, running around the, the 20th time, my sister busts through the doors. She said, hey. <laughs> she said, there's a phone call for you. I said, Linda, you know I told you, don't bother me. I'm trying to, you know, trying to be real spiritual, right? <laughs> and uh, she said, no, I think you want to take this phone, little emergency. Little emergency, you want to take this phone. Like, don't. You know, you think you're right there in there with God and you uh, uh, like, like don't bother me. I'm super spiritual right now. You, you unspiritual by coming in here. Y'all know how y'all do y'all fam. How you do your spouses. <laughs> I'm talking to somebody. <laughs> I've been praying for two hours and you ain't praying nothing. And yours didn't go nowhere because you were mad because he wasn't praying. I just felt that in the spirit. <laughs> so I get to the phone. I'm, I'm upset because they didn't disturb me. And the lady on the phone wailing. Oh, boss, you must do I'm like, yes, that's what's going on. Somebody died. You know, what, what's going on? She said, for the last hour and a half, uh, the Holy Ghost has been dealing with me. Yes, hallelujah, what? I want to get back to prayer. <laughs> she said, me and my husband, we had some stock. And uh, the Holy Ghost told us we need to pull it down and give it to the church. It's the exact amount that I was praying for. And the technology was not prayer. There was something in the spirit that I had to run for. And while I was running, the Holy Ghost was talking to her. You got to ask the Holy Ghost, what is going to give me a breakthrough in this particular area? The walls of Jericho didn't come down because they fought. It, worked. it came down because they walked. The rain didn't stop. Don't start until Elijah prayed. He controlled an atmosphere. The Bible says Elijah said, okay, y'all want to mess with me and my God? The Bible says he went into prayer. Minga na na. And he started controlling the atmosphere of that region. And he said, it will not rain, but at my word. He had such a technology that when he spoke in the atmosphere, he said, no rain will hit this territory until I say so. And for three years, it did not rain. The Bible says that no even dew came on the ground. Y'all not hear me. You got to control an atmosphere. And the Bible says he put his head beneath his, in between his knees and prayed again. And it began to rain. He told Ahab, get up. <laughs> He says, it's about to rain. Yeah. Who do you become when you can control atmosphere? That's what the enemy does. He sends a Jezebel on your job. And you so confused and so hurt that you want to quit the job God gave you. Instead of controlling the atmosphere and getting rid of the Jezebel, don't complain. Don't talk about them. 
Go back to your prayer closet. It may take a seven day fast. It may take giving them a gift. It may whatever technology the Holy Ghost gives you. You're going to control that atmosphere. And you're not going to let anybody manipulate your, your emotions. Because you become the master of your emotions. I know how to govern me. I don't know how to govern you. But I know how to govern me. And the atmosphere over me. You might be mean and nasty. But it will not come nigh my dwelling. I don't take your ignorance personal. I'm going to say it again. I don't take your ignorance personal. I don't take your ignorance personal. I am so built a reservoir of who I am. You can't make me come down from my lofty place. So and so don't like me. <laughs> she haven't engaged the right me. Who sent her? And she don't even know she's been used. You look at them and say, You being used. <laughs> Cause everybody in my world loves me. No, no. No, you don't even war with that stuff. You know, they always say the opposite of hot is cold, the opposite of hate is love. No, it's not. Opposite of love is love. The opposite of love, there is no hate. Because once you love, there is nowhere else to go. You can't love somebody and then hate them. You use the word incorrectly because you don't understand the essence of love. God is love. Are you hearing me? So I can't say I love you today and hate you tomorrow. No, if I love you, I love you. There's no opposites. We fell out of love. No. Let's stop using that. We fell out of engagement. But I can never, if I ever loved him, I could never fall out of love. That's why some of you still love your ex and think it's a sin. It's not a sin to love him because you're supposed to. You just can't live with him. And so the enemy would spin the narrative to hate him. I don't know why I'm on this. I don't know why I'm in this vein, but I feel this in the spirit. Are you hearing me? That you got to hate your ex. No. No, if I ever... I was going to get real con. If you ever love somebody... Y'all yeah, looking at them. No, their performance and their behavior didn't meet your expectation. But that don't make me hate them. And a lot of you sick and stuck because you hate your ex. I feel the prophetic now. I feel a Samuel's anointing coming in here. Tell your neighbor, I love my ex. That's why you got all the mind battles. <laughs> why you got all the mind battles. I love my ex. I just can't live with him. I can't, I can't be involved with him. But once I love somebody because of who I am in God, I can't hate them. I don't like their performance or their behavior, but I always love them. I'm freeing somebody. I done free you. I done free. And don't let your girlfriend tell me, I don't know how you still in love. We just can't live together. And then you won't spin that narrative to your children. To hate their father or their mother. Are y'all hearing me? No, 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 no. You're going to teach them love. Why? Because then that thing that is holding you in a holding pattern because you don't love and forgive will keep your children stuck and they'll end up hating you because you distance them from their, their father. 
and wondering why now there is a great divide between you and your child because all their life you put in them hate for their father. He ain't nothing. He ain't going to be nothing because you mad. God, why am I in this vein? Jesus, help me. They don't want to talk to me. They don't like. Why? Because you took their father. And until you make that right, they're going to always be distant. You got to bring him back into honor. Honor your father and mother. Wives, you got to honor your husband or honor the one you were with. Because if you had sex, then God sees him as your husband. God, why am I on this? Jesus, help me. Lord God, help me. Jesus. Every time you have sex, that's your husband. Or that's your wife. In the kingdom. Now the world says you got to go get a legal paper, you know, from, the, from your local government to be married. No, you're married in the spirit. It's called soul ties. The Bible says when you lay down with a harlot, you become one. And so everybody, and we take people through, and, and some people got 40 marriages they got to dissolve. God help. Just keep looking straight. I'm not even looking at you. Just keep through something. Just keep looking straight. Governing your atmosphere. If you quit projecting the wrong image. The wrong people will stop coming in your life. So even with that, you've got to create a spiritual atmosphere that is conducive for the man to come to you. I don't know how I'm going to switch from governing spiritual atmospheres. God help me. I'm helping somebody and y'all ain't saying nothing. Because a lot of spiritual warfare ain't the devil and imps and wimps. Are you hearing me? It is thoughts and images that you project that causes them to come. If I stop projecting that, I won't give the enemy an open door to my address. Unless your address from foolishness. No, it can't work over here. That don't work over here. No, 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 no. You see, see, Ruth, Ruth had to change her, her address. In the few minutes that I got left, Ruth, isn't it amazing how God, God will start moving stuff to get you to your place. Her father-in-law died. Her husband died. Her brother died. His brother died. Her brother-in-law died. So anybody that will keep her there, God killed it. Now you can say what you want. Some folk, God just moved out of your life. Y'all gonna say I'm real. Y'all gonna say y'all gonna say something. Y'all not gonna like me because I said this. But had my mother lived, I wouldn't have been a preacher. Are you saying God killed your mother? No, I'm saying in it, I was able to see who God called me to be because she would have been my biggest crutch. Oh, see y'all, y'all ain't liking this. Y'all ain't liking this. I wouldn't have been, I would have never met you. I would have never met Bishop or or Lady Vivian. I would have never, I would have never been here had my mother still lived because I would have never took this path. Why did Jesus only live 33 years? He was finished. Nancy, you shouldn't say that. It's the truth. I love my mother when she was my best friend, you know what I'm saying? But the Lord knew destiny wouldn't have come forth. 
Get in the kingdom and get out of your own little world. You should be ashamed of yourself. No, you should be ashamed to hold folk that God want to release you from so you can be all that you can be. And the reason God told you to release some folk is because they were going to stop you from doing what he called you to do. Thank God you didn't marry him when you were supposed to. Thank God you didn't go where you were supposed to go because now you're able to do what God has called. God gets rid of the husband, the brother-in-laws, and her father-in-law, and now they're forced to go back. And Naomi is bitter. But Ruth wouldn't let bitterness get in her. After losing all of that, she says, look, I can't go back. Oprah went back. She said, I can't go back. I don't know where we're going, but I've been there. And I'd rather go, I'm adventurous, I'd rather go somewhere I've never gone than to go backwards and stay complacent. Even if I got to work a little bit. The Bible says she got up every morning, come on, start working the field. Start, say work it. Lazy folk won't get anything done. You got to work it. You, you, come on, you got to work it. Say work it. It's just like, look, I, look, I said I was coming, but I'm not going to be bitter. I'm not going to sit in this house and be bitter and complain and be grieving all day because what's gone, they gone now. I got to live. Come on. Y'all talking about I'm being insensitive. I'm not being insensitive. I've just learned technology that if you don't release people, they'll keep you in bondage in grieving for them when they're free and you're stuck. They're gone. And if they're going to heaven, honey, let me tell you something, because I feel a grief in here, because somebody just recently lost somebody, and that grief is stuck in you, and you can't hardly breathe and get forward, because you think you're honoring them by grieving for them, and they was, they'll look at you and say, please, no more tears for me. She worked in the field, and all of a sudden... A Boaz, she glean in the field. She creating an atmosphere. <laughs> now all the other women out there working, but Ruth know how to create the atmosphere. Y'all not hear me? She didn't use nails and butts. Boaz don't want a BBL or PPP or DDD. A real Boaz want to know, can you work? I want a rich man. You think a rich man want a lazy woman? No. A rich man want a rich woman. Y'all not hearing me. That... So don't try to get what you're not. You can't attract what you're not. And until you get to the atmosphere and the dimension that you're rich, you'll start attracting men that have wealth. But if you're a broke woman trying to get a rich man, who do you attract? Broke men. Because as a man thinketh, y'all going to get me in a minute. Consciously, I have to already receive that I already am. Come on, I preach the message being versus doing. If I be it, the doing is easy. No, we try to do it until you be it. The promises of God are yes. What does amen mean? So be it. So be it. So we, we, we think it's... Uh, it's done, right? When we say so be it, what does that mean? Done where? Where? Oh, I found you. It's done where? On earth. And who's the earth? 
See, it'll never be done until you have, have the reality that it's done in me. It just hadn't manifest yet. See, we messed up on the manifestation. The manif you think the manifestation means it's not done. It's done. When you buy cake mix, some of y'all got Duncan Hines and what's his name, Betty Crocker and all that, all that artificial stuff. You buy the cake mix, right? In expectation of a what? You are confident that you will produce a cake. You haven't seen the cake yet. You telling everybody, I'm going to bake a cake. Are you hearing me? You're in expectation of a cake. It's already done in your mind, but you hadn't started yet. You bought the ingredients. What goes in the box cake? Eggs. What else? Y'all should be shamed fixing them box cakes. Yeah. Oil. And what do you do? You're, you're not worried that you're not able to produce a cake. Who's producing the cake? Huh? Betty Crocker gave you the ingredients and you with your own hands with the ingredients you've been given will produce a cake. Will Betty Crocker come and cook the cake or bake the cake? You have to take the ingredients, mix them together called prayer, faith, fasting, praise, Worship, giving. And you be like, <laughs> that's it. Not finished yet, right? See, see, we miss these things with God because we want things to come overnight, but sometimes it's a process. Are you hearing me? Now you got the cake batter and it's in the bowl. You're through mixing it with the mixer. Now it's time to put it where? You got you got to grease, grease, oil, grease, grease the pan. If you the new cakes, you don't have to put no flour around there. So, so, and then you have to shove it. You have to heat the oven though. Can't put it in a cold oven. So that means some situations going to get a little hot. Before the final manifestation, some things got to heat up. And what happens is, in the heating process, we wig out. We don't want to go through the baking process. We don't want the fire to touch us. Tell your neighbor... The oven is preheating. I'm about to go in. But just like Daniel and the three Hebrew boys, I won't be burned. Because this latter glory is greater than the former. And watch me when I come out. Everybody going to be able to taste and see that the Lord is good in me. going through for you you're going through for everybody in your family ladies we can't wig out when the pressure gets turned up you become cool as a cucumber knowing that the trying of my faith will work patience and when patience is full and has its perfection. I'll be entire wanting nothing. You shove that thing in there. And you're not looking. You're not looking. You're not looking to see if it's going to rise. In the ingredients is the ability for that thing to rise. You put it in there flat. 
But all of a sudden, after 30 minutes, you'll see it. You don't take it out because it just is rising. You wait till it brown. You got to wait that it's cooked all the way through. Don't ask God to bring you out until you're well done. <laughs> all of a sudden, Boaz said, huh, I see a little piece of cake. She got a little caramel on her, a little chocolate. See some strawberry. Wait a minute. She don't look like that one. Leave a little more for her. See if she come back. Are you angry? You got to create an atmosphere out of your contamination. Where my musician? You got to create an atmosphere. That is conducive. All the people. <laughs> I got a large family. I got a decent sized house. <laughs> and uh, everybody want to come to my house. <laughs> everybody want to come to my house. I'm like, I'm everybody want to come to my house. Every holiday. <laughs> just coming in town. Just driving by. Everybody want to come to my house. My sister' house is big. She got big house. Yeah, you know. Everybody can come to my house. My sister lived, you know, about 15 minutes. She she was like, "Hey, hey, sis, I know, I know you're gonna be preaching up up in Maryland." She said, um, "But we were thinking about, you know, going by your house." <laughs> Wait a minute. You were just there last week. No, matter, matter, matter of fact, you were there every day. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, you know, her was like thinking about putting some stuff on the grill. And uh, we think about watching some movies and maybe go swimming. And I'm not there. She said, it's something about your house. I have created, here y'all go, I don't want everybody in my house. No, I have created an atmosphere that whatever is on them, they can feel free in my house. Y'all not hearing me. God didn't give me the house for me. He gave me a habitation that anybody come into my habitation have to experience so I keep my grandsons for this season and my grandsons, I'm through, my grandsons, they got the ability to attract pastor, they got the uh, pastor, they got the ability to attract all the boys in the neighborhood, black, white, Hispanic, Korean, they just, uh, and they come through, hey, hey, hey. And it was raining the other day and you know, I got hardwood floors and, and they was like, hey, and water just everywhere and I'm like, shut up. And I got a pantry and I keep it stocked, man of God, because my grandsons, amen. And, uh, and everything is kind of, I'm not that word, but I'm in order. So all of them run by the pantry. Water in the pantry. Run in my grandson's rooms. I said, God. This is a bus, you know, you know. This is my habitation, sanctuary. You know, running through the house. So I'm at the nail salon the other day, and the woman taps me on the shoulder. She said, Pastor Nesbitt? I said, yes. She said, I thought that was you. She said, ever since my son has been hanging with Kai, he's praying more. <laughs> what is it costing me? other than mopping a lot and desanitizing 
sanitize, and some extra snacks to say he's praying more because I created an atmosphere where they can be free. You say folk don't like you? Have you created an atmosphere where hate is at your entry? I'm always broke. Have you created an atmosphere and hang with folk that are broke? Y'all ain't going to like that. Because what they carry, you should know that from COVID. <laughs> if they contagious, you can become contagious if you haven't built an immune system. Sometimes you got to build a spiritual immune system against things that will come. Stand on your feet. Come on, play, 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 play. What do you want hope to be? What kind of atmosphere you want over hope? You're in a great position. You're strategically placed here. And you can say what's in the neighborhoods, what's in, you know, it's drug infested, it's poverty. But what's over hope? What atmosphere you want to create over hope? Apostle says she's changing the sound. So what is that sound going to be? Is it going to be a sound of murmuring, complaining? Why is she doing that? Why is she on that? Why are we doing that now? Why are we doing that now? Why, why don't you just be quiet and flow? Because in building a sound... If your heart is not right, your sound can be contaminated. Tell people all the time, if you think people are wrong, let God deal with them. And you just be quiet. If I'm wrong, I tell my leader, if I'm wrong, let God deal with me. Don't deal with me because you're going to cause a curse because I've already created an atmosphere right now. That anybody step towards me. Yeah, it, are y'all getting what I'm saying? How do you build a house? Pour the slab first. The Bible says take into account how you're going to build. Build on a solid foundation. Then you start putting walls up. What do I want to let in? What do I want to keep out? Put the roof on so nothing can settle over my head. Thoughts, imagination, emotions, I got it clear. Are you hearing me? Then you start putting doors in, restrictions. You can't come here. You can't do this. Who am I going to let in my room? Who do I let in my bedroom? Who do I let in me? Building a spiritual atmosphere that is conducive for God to do what he needs to do. What do you carry? Are you always happy? Are you always sad? Do you always need encouragement? Or will you give encouragement? What? If we see you coming, will we run? Are you begging? Are you needy? What atmosphere do you carry? The world said, what's your aura? Scientists say 19 inches from you is the projection of your thoughts. Now you don't let anybody in your space. And then you know why you keep attracting the same thing. Because the energy field that's coming from you is always negative, complaining, nasty, mean. Count it all joy. Joy. Unspeakable, full of glory. Happy. <laughs> Laughter, do it good like a medicine. Some of y'all laugh. Come on, just laugh. Some of y'all is too even mean to laugh. Some of y'all won't even smile. Can you at least smile? Just everybody smile. With 32 or 2, just smile. 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 Smile at your neighbor. Smile. 
laugh. <laughs> Next, but I don't got nothing to laugh about. I ain't got nothing to smile about. Smile anyway. I'm creating an atmosphere so I can laugh, so I can smile. I do it by faith. I do it by faith. Lift your hands. Pray in tongues, I'm over my time. Come on, come on, pray. Pray, create an atmosphere around you. Like you're building that bubble around you. You're building an atmosphere around you. You're building an atmosphere around you. Joy, peace, righteousness, holiness, sanctification, wealth. I'm building an atmosphere of wealth. I'm building an atmosphere where riches will flow. Riches will flow. Riches will be attracted to me. Wealth will come into my hands. I create an atmosphere. There's an anointing. Come on, it's falling on you. Glory. Glory. Create glory. Create glory. That there's an atmosphere of glory. That they're cool. I've got to create this atmosphere of glory. This atmosphere that when people engage me, they feel God. When people speak to me, they say something is different about you. Something has changed. You're not mean anymore. You're not negative anymore. You're not hating anymore. I feel love coming from you. I feel the love. I, you're patient with me now. I feel something has changed. You sound different. You talk different. You talk different. I'm building an atmosphere of everything and everybody I want in my atmosphere. Come on, pray. Out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. Let the rivers flow. Come on, the levant Hatred is removed. Love, forgiveness, healing, restoration, power, power of the anointing, the mantle. Let the love of God flow through you. Let the love of God, let the love of God, let the power of the Christ. Hallelujah. Let this church begin to rise. To the place where the sound of the heavens will be emitted from this house. That the sound from this house will reach the White House. That the sound from this house will reach the crack house. That the sound from this house will go into the nations. That the sound will attract angels. The sound will attract men and women that are desperate for the power of God that the sound that is released from this house he can do a rebakata rebakata takele levanto and the frequency will bring healing will bring revival will bring deliverance he can do the bounce bebekata let the angels in the bakototo merge with the sound let there be a harmonious symphonic rhythmic movement of the sound of heaven in this house father we create a sound that will penetrate gates that will penetrate portals that will penetrate hearts and minds let the convicting power of the holy ghost and the wind and the wind of the holy ghost begin to blow let the whistle of the holy ghost resound in the ears of those who are desperate to hear a new sound to hear a new voice to hear a new praise to hear new worship let the sound of the holy ghost begin to flow in this place let the sound under me on so let the sound let the sound of the Holy Ghost blow. Let the build an atmosphere. Build this atmosphere that makes it easy for the apostle. Build this atmosphere 
where miracles take place at Chukula Mande Levanto. Feel the atmosphere, San Mande Levanto, with your prayers. Build it with your tears. Build it with your worship. Build it with your faithfulness. Build it with your loyalty. Build it. Build it. Build it with fasting. Build it. Build it. Build it. And let the wells of the Spirit be open. Let the wells of the Spirit be open. Let the fragrance of the heavens be realized. Let the fragrance of the heavens be imparted let the smell of the almighty be released let this house emit a sound let the atmosphere over this territory build an ark of safety for those who are desperate for those who are hungry, for those who need healing, let this be a revival center. Let this be a transformation house. Let this be an awakening place. And Let the sound amplify your voice. Let there be velocity in your voice. Let there be a sound that comes forth. Let there be a praise. Let there be adoration, exhortation. Let the manifestation of the heavens come on. Pray, 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 pray. Lift your voice. Lift your voice. Get up and look. See me. Get up and look. He's listening. He's looking for your sound. Come on, your atmosphere. Change it. 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 Lift your voice like a trumpet and let the heavens hear you. They're coming for your voice. They're coming for your words. Make sure your atmosphere it's clear. Make sure your atmosphere is open.
today that have been affecting your the atmosphere of your family, the atmosphere of your workplace, the atmosphere of your mind, the atmosphere of your finances. Come on, it's time to release them. Come on, it's time to release them and pick up what the Father has. Come on, you just begin to do business with God. You don't need an invitation, but I'm inviting you right now to step in, to not be on the sidelines of a word like this, but then to begin to engage with God and to begin to make the exchange. Ora ma 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 ma. Ora ba 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 sa kaye. Se te rebo saya. Oh Father, we thank you, even according to Isaiah 61, that you give what the oil of joy for the spirit of heaviness. Come on, continue, continue to press in and receive. Continue to press in and receive. Come on, we can eat anytime. But when God is moving, when He's releasing something to us, something that is supernatural, supernatural that cannot be replaced, we have to press in. Come on, come on. I thank you, God, that generational cycles are even being broken in this atmosphere of intercession, of exchange, of divine exchange. Get up. 
Come on, come on, we're breaking. We're breaking out and we're breaking into a new dimension of authority in Christ. Come on, every false identity, every false place that we've lived out of. Come on, begin to release those things at the foot of the cross today. Come on. He has called you to be more than a conqueror. He has called you to walk. He's given you hind feet. He's given you the preparation of the peace of the gospel. He's causing you to be steady in your walk as you step into the truth of who you are. Come on, right now is the time. Right now is the time to step into that next dimension. You might say, I've been in Christ, but there's still more. There's still another dimension of glory. There's still another dimension of power. There's still another dimension that God wants to release to you. Come on, step in. Come on, step in. We're going to push for a few more minutes because I feel heaven beginning to respond to the sound of the hunger that is in this room. Come on, come on.
fork in the road. And today is the day to get on the path. And it's no turning back. Come on, you decree it over you. There's no turning back. I'm on the path. I'm on the path. And there's no turning back. Father, we thank you right now that what you have begun today, you will be faithful to bring it into completion. And even as we have labored, even as we've begun to travail and begin to apprehend what you are releasing over this house, God, we fully step in to the sound of heaven. God, to cultivate the atmosphere over our own life, over the areas that you've called us to have influence in the medical field, in the school system, in the business realm, all of the areas and even in the church that you've called us to steward. Father, we release you to do which only you can do now. We yield to your leading. We surrender to your authority. And let it be done in us so that it can be done in this region. Let it be done in us so that it can be done in our children and our children's children. Let it be done in us that it might be established even in this nation. If you agree with that prayer, come on and say amen. Hallelujah. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. I'm going to release you for a short break because we have workshops this afternoon. You don't have to move if you are unable or do not want to. We're going to come back at 1.45. What time are we coming back? Okay, we're having three workshops. One is Pastor Thelma Hayes building a worldview in your parenting, biblical worldview in your parenting. How many need that? So you're going to want to uh, meet Pastor Thelma. Where are you going to be? In the youth worship hall. Are you prepared for your legacy? What you will leave your children? Are you ready? How many need legal help to do that? Attorney Seren Adams will be in the chapel. And then we'll be here with Elder Yvonne Shack and Donna Mazik. And we're going to continue the work of stewarding the, the atmosphere of your life, healing. So if you're going through a season of coming out of trauma, you're going to meet us here because we're going to be talking about overcoming trauma. I want to invite you to make sure you get Dr. Nesbitt's new book, Accessing Ancient Portals, Unlocking the Hebraic Foundations of the Faith to Experience the Supernatural. They're in the lobby, and she'll be here today and tomorrow for our 9 a.m. intercession, 10 o'clock service, so you're invited. So what time are we coming back for workshops? All right, go in grace, make a new friend, and we'll see you at 145.
How is everybody? Yeah, doing okay? So, um, if you're here for this session, is it okay if you guys come closer? how it is in school. You snooze, you lose. No, I'm kidding. If they come back for their stuff, that's fine. But we just want to be close together. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I found a new place. All right, so we're going to open up with a word of prayer, and then we're just going to kind of get into a conversation this afternoon um, with the word of God and personal experience about overcoming some things. And I believe it'll be helpful for our personal lives, but also in ministering to others. So, Father, we thank you for what you are already doing through the conference. We thank you for how you've already been speaking and Lord, we thank you that you have a remedy for every pain and every hurt and every wound. And so, Lord, we thank you that as you're teaching our hands to war spiritually, you're uncovering and exposing the enemy's strategies against us that we might come out and into the promises of God. So we thank you today, Lord, for the uncovering and then also the healing that we all need so that we can be those conduits of your grace. Holy Spirit, we welcome you to be the revealer of truth. We submit to the authority of Christ and we thank you, Lord, that you are moving in our midst. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so let me introduce the two women of God that are a part of um, today's time together. I'm honored to serve with them here in the church, and we minister to women. So to, to my left, Elder Yvonne Shack serves as the oversight for our personal consultation and personal ministry department. What does that mean? Counseling and deliverance. And we call that here points of breakthrough. So we meet God, and that is our point of breakthrough through counseling and deliverance. And then I have Donna Mazik here, who oversees our grief ministry called Grief Share. And she's also a part of our Hope Healing House. So she is a deliverance minister herself, healing minister. And she has worked in the counseling field for how many years? Since 2004, so we'll go with 19 years. We'll go with 19 years. So these are seasoned women who um, not only can give biblical wisdom, but are skilled in this area, which is so important. You, did you know you could be both? Yes. Filled with the Holy Ghost and skillful in natural things. So that's important. All right. So our topic today is overcoming trauma. And you're going to see back here some things that we'll get to. But I thought it was important because trauma is a word that is very much used nowadays. And sometimes when things are overused, it can minimize what we're actually going through. And it can cause us to compare. And so we just wanted to open up and just begin to dialogue about how do we come out of, of what we've gone through. So who would like to start? You know, I, I, I'm a real practical person, so I always have these pictures and things that I, I like to bring down, uh, bring 
uh, clarity to very difficult topics. And I think about trauma is, is uh, if we can think about it in natural, if someone hits us with something in the natural, it hurts. You know, if, if it's a hammer, if it's a, if it's a bat, a ball, or something that happens in the natural that we know for sure, we look at our bodies, we see the bruises, and we know that we've experienced a trauma. But that's also true when we are hit with things in our lives that uh, hurts and disappointments and, and expectations that, that are not realized. Uh, those are, are traumatic situations. And if you're living, I guarantee you, you have experienced uh, trauma. You all living, right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> all right. So each of us have have experienced trauma, and and the word in the word we know that the Lord knows all about it because He's given us a rope, a map to be free of those things. So um, today, we as we look at this process, you know, we we just thinking over the last three days. That this is two days, right? Two days. We've talked about, we've heard over and over again the theme of identity. We, the enemy's goal is to snatch our identity from us, to cause us to not be who God has called us to be. That has been, that has been, that is so true, and that is the goal of trauma. When we are, we don't have the, the tools that we need to be free of trauma then we don't know how to give the enemy an eviction notice. And what I, the thing that I picked up, that I thought about last night, this is about, even though we want to define it and all of that, we want, the goal of this time is to, to teach us how to give the enemy an eviction, eviction notice so that we can walk in the fullness of all that God has promised for us. And when we have those places in us, that are, we are walking out that trauma, then God in his mercy is able to use us, but he wants to take us to another place, a greater place. And that, that trauma, which is, uh, manifests itself in sh uh, shame, fear, and control, or rejection, rebellion control, keeps the cycle going in our lives and keeps, prevents us from being all that we can be. That controls, holds that cycle together. And it's like um, an electric circuit. Because of our experiences, we develop a certain belief system. We have a certain expectation. And then as a result of that, then we, we behave in a certain way. And that circuit keeps going around. It's like control is the switch box that keeps the, the process from going and prevents us from being all that God has called us to be. Wow, this is powerful. So for those that are just coming in, welcome, welcome. I want to tell you that in 2018, I fell out the bathtub. I fell out of the bathtub, and I hit my legs so hard that my legs swole up in the moment, and I thought, okay, this is over, right? So I thought if I ice it, if I elevate it, I would be healed. Well, then I ended up having to go to the doctor two weeks later and getting an x-ray because we weren't sure if my ankle or my leg was broken because it was now throbbing. And the skin was red and inflamed, you know, when your skin is angry. Mm -hmm. What well, turned out that I had a bone bruise. And it was going to take a year and a half for my leg to heal and to be back normal. Some of the things that we go through emotionally are just like that. Where we fall, we hurt ourselves, and we're thinking, I should be over this. But it takes a process of time, doctors, counselors, deliverance, a process of walking through to total healing. Now, on the inside of my right leg, there's a spot where hair does not grow. <laughs> 
So that's technically the scar, but there's no more pain, right? So a bone bruise is called a hematoma. So that's what I had, you know. But I bring that up in the context of the conversation we're having today because there are things that may have happened a long time ago that if I were to touch you right now in your emotions, you'd be saying, ouch. And it's deeper, the roots are entwined in a deeper place in this shame, fear, control that we're going to explain to you and in this rejection, rebellion, abandonment, stronghold. And so today what we want to do is unfold a process by which you can begin to receive healing. So it did actually take a year and a half for my body to be able to break down the bruise, the blood clot that was on top of the bone in my leg. And for when I touched my leg or put lotion on my leg, that it wasn't hurting anymore. And so I think that if we can see our soul not just as a place that's um, immaterial, but a place that has to be maintained, cultivated, whole, pure, then we can maintain our mind, our will and emotions in a way like we would our physical body. Wow. <laughs> Can we get to other things? Yes. Okay. Oh, just get that. So you just got an illustration of what trauma can look like. Mm -hmm. But I'd like to let you know that one of the challenges that um, Elder Yvonne will speak about um, is sometimes we don't see inside, right? And so we're body, soul, and spirit. And there are times when we have trauma, which is not only about the events of our lives, but it's also about the response that we have to the events. That's the, the year and a half one. That's the decade long one. That's the lifelong one. So one of the things we want to set um, just a, an expectation from where we're coming from. Like, I've gone through trauma. I've lived through trauma. I love butterflies because butterflies show me that there's a process to get out of a dark, tight place and to emerge whole. That's what the Lord has provided for us, and that's the perspective that we're bringing to you today. This isn't just a, a title of a of a workshop, we can overcome trauma. And, and if I can, before we get into the, the, um, the shame, fear, control, and, and the other strongholds with rejection and rebellion, I'm also a nurse, so I've got to bring you in to a little more of this physical part of us, okay? So in our bodies, we have a nervous system. I want to just touch on briefly the autonomic nervous system which regulates body processes. And, and there are things like blood pressure or, or the rate that we're breathing. We don't even think about it. It's, it just happens. It's auto, automatic, right? This system works um, automatically without our conscious effort. But this system has two components, the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system functions like a gas pedal on your car. What happens? You, 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 you move. You, you, you go fast. It triggers the fight or flight response that can be a response to, to trauma. And it can respond to perceived dangers. And it's helpful. The parasympathetic nervous system acts like a break. So it's, it's the part of us that rests and digests what's happening. And it can calm us down. One of the things that will come up as we talk more about the hidden parts of our response to trauma is that recovering from trauma takes time. You know, we, it's, it's not often that you hear, as Apostle Michelle shared, that a physical issue took that long. It takes that long. It can take longer to go through the healing process. The butterfly comes out beautifully but it's been a process. So we heard earlier today that it takes a process 
everyone heals at their own pace. And the one thing that you'll understand as, as I turn it back to um, Elder Yvonne is that the body works so, so hard to keep us um, ex experiencing, uh, to keep us feeling safe and protected. And sometimes that hard work works against us. We want that hard work to just kind of be in the flow that the spirit has. And I'll leave you hanging on that one and come back to it in a little bit. I, I, you probably see these uh, posters back here, whatever they are. I guess they're posters. Uh, Elder Dorothy and I went to grad school together, and we developed this for our, my daughter to drew it. Uh, for uh, so that we can kind of explain this concept, and I'm just gonna uh, walk back there. Um, we were talking about the fact that there are things uh, that the roots are underneath, and they said they're gonna show it on the camera. So I don't know. That's good. <laughs> they are. Oh, so the first thing that you see is the roots of abandonment here. But the thing with us, do we see the roots? The way that we see the roots actually is in the behavior that we exhibit tells us that there are roots there. And I just, you know, we, we develop some of these roots that are not positive ourselves, but I just want to let you know some of the roots that we are dealing with are roots from our ancestors. Things that have gone through our family line that hasn't been repented of. So in the good news, Jesus died. And he's made the way for us to walk in freedom. This particular, um, this side of this tree, this is the tree here. And I'm going to just read it to you since you, you can't see it. Uh, we see at the bottom of the tree, we, we see uh, negative characteristics such as rejection. We talked about aban abandonment. We talked about rebellion. We talked about um, different things, the different behaviors. And then, then we, we look at the impact of those things on our mind. Things like hostile toward God, self-centered, for a performance-based acceptance, rejects the Holy Spirit, chooses self, and, and, impri and imprisons self. And then we, we continue go, and going up. If the root is one way, then we know the fruit is going to be a certain way, right? right? So now we're looking at the fruit. This is an unhealthy tree. You can see that in the differences in these two trees. And we see on this tree self-rejection, anger, depression, fear, guilt, hate, murder, suspicion. We could say attitude towards you, somebody, you know, revenge, uh, competition, independence, stubbornness, poor self-image, defensiveness, uh, self-pity. But this is, this is what is, is underground. These, the roots are underground. This is what the tree is bearing. But our goal is, this is what Jesus died for, that, we, that our root system will change when we ask God's forgiveness, right? When we, we forgive, we ask for forgiveness for those things we've done. We forgive on, on behalf of, of those people who have sinned against us. Then our root system changes. Then the Holy Spirit is in charge. Then Jesus and his truth. And we begin to have the mind of Christ, right? And then our system changes. Look at the tree, the fruit that's on this tree. Faith, kindness, peace, love self-control, patience, goodness, long-suffering, and joy. Amen. So when we were praying today about stepping into the place of our authority and knowing who we are, you need to take a picture of this with your phone so that you have that, so that when you're recognizing fruits in our lives, or behaviors that are not like the Lord, we can ask the Holy Spirit, 
okay, help me to know where this is coming from. Okay. We were training, we were doing prophetic training, and we were talking about the Johnson grass, and we were talking about how wheat and tares look the same, right? Yeah. And yeah. how the Johnson grass attaches and, and siphons out all the nutrients in the soil that the wheat's supposed to get, and how once they've been sown together, you can't tell by looking at the seed sometimes what the difference is, but you can tell by the fruit. And just by um, removing the fruit doesn't um, change what's being produced. We have to change the root system. So that's really what we're going after when it comes to overcoming the trauma because there are cycles in our life that we go through that unless we address the root of what's happening or saying, Holy Spirit, will you show me what the root of this is, then we continue to see things um, happen. Uh, in, in reference to the, the system that we mentioned earlier about the uh, uh, shame, fear, and control and, and rejection, rebellion, and control, I just want to uh, just just to shed the light on some of the ways that we we manifest uh, the idea of that there is a root system that is not operating according to God's word. So um, one uh, one of them is shame, and it says I'm bad, I'm different from everyone else. Fear says I'm afraid that anybody if anybody finds me out. Uh, find out that I'm bad, I am, uh, they will not accept or approve of me. Um, control says I have to control my environment and everyone in it so that no one discovers my defects. If control is threatened in any way, rebellion instructs us to resist, get angry, hate, scheme, strategize to get to, re to, to regain control. And, you know, we probably can see those areas in the relationships that we are closest, where we are closest to people, like in relationships with our husbands, in relationship with our parents, in those comfortable places, you know, that we, we can see ourselves operating in that system. Shame believes, uh, shame, believing, thinking, uh, feeling I'm bad, I am flawed, I'm defective, I'm a mistake, rather than realizing the situation is a choice, we just kind of follow that line of thinking. And we, are doing, we do it year after year after year after year, not realizing that we are not walking in the fullness of all that God has, has promised to us. There are things that God has said to us that we, we, we don't do because that lie, and that's important, underline, underline, that lie, we believed a lie and it's preventing us from being all that we, we uh, should be. Can I just say that there was a study that Christian counselors did that says that 80% of Christians live in shame? And, but here's the kicker. Do you want to know something that's also very true? 100% of people have been through shaming events. Yeah. So it really is a choice as to whether or not we live in that identity. So if we are walking in a shame-based identity, we're believing our life's experiences, other people's words, our failures, our thoughts, um, rather than who we are in Christ. So um, shame also damages our personality. Um, it deals with who we are, not just our, our performance. So it deals with our, our sense of worth. Um, how many grew up in a time where people said you're a loser? Is anybody old enough to have had that happen? <laughs> um, <laughs> But that's shame-based. That's a shame-based comment, right? And so society tells you you're a loser, you suck, all that kind of thing, right? Um, and so all of those, 
that all of those things come against us to make us feel ashamed or as Elder Yvonne was saying, defective um, in, in the ways of who we are. Even advertising says you're not enough until you buy this product. <laughs> you're putting on masks to try to cover up your defectiveness, right? Think about that. This whole self-care thing, if I don't buy this $400 cream, then I'm not going to be beautiful and I don't love myself or care for myself enough. Sorry, don't get me off on a tangent. But anyway, all that's... <laughs> All of that is all shame-based kind of tactics. You know what I'm saying? So when you start to think about that, it kind of puts you in a different state of mind. Just the, the problem with shame, it's a big problem. It doesn't stop with shame. So in this next slide, you'll see the cycle that can appear. There's a constellation of... of um, ways that we operate um, in terms of controlling our environment. We forget that Jesus is our defender. Jesus is our protector. And especially if we've gone through traumas from childhood, it's just, you know, when we were children, we thought as children. We did what we did as children. But as we become adults, we have to put away childish things. And the word of God shows us um, our identity. And so this whole issue of shame is accompanied with fear. And that is the stronghold. We know we want authority. We want godly authority, what he's given us, to rule and reign in, in our lives. But when we don't go that route, the control is part of this constellation of shame and fear. Fear causes us to, to feel unprotected, unsafe, insecure. Fear stems from shame. So you see that cycle. You know, you see the arrow leaving shame to fear. As we are fearful that our shame, or like I said earlier, defectiveness will be exposed. But isn't it, it the lie, you see the lie there, our defectiveness. Who says? You know, the enemy has, has implanted that thought, and in, in very often from, from childhood, as D D uh, Donna was saying, is that, and so we, we don't even realize that we're living out that thing. You know, in school, kids call me Big Buddy. I, all my life, I thought that I was huge. I mean, I'm not little, but... <laughs> <laughs> But, but the thing is, I was shocked when I saw a picture of me at the age that they were calling me that I was very tall compared to them. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. But instantly, my thought processes were that I was just huge and, and ugly, if you were huge. That wasn't an acceptable thing to do. So the enemy lied to me over and over again about that. So that's a shaming statement. You know, I, I didn't laugh with them, but, and I didn't say anything, but that seed had been planted, and I walked that seed out over and over and over again. And for some of us, the same thing is happening. So then that question, if I do this or that, then they're going to see that I'm defective. So anytime we, we have to begin to question Learn how to question what we think. Mm -hmm. Ask God, the Holy Spirit, to show you what is it that you are seeing, what is it you are thinking, what is hindering you from being who God has called you to be. And assume if, if God has called you and you shrink back instantly with the thought, I don't have the ability to do that. What are they talking about? What is, you know, what's, you know surely they do not know that I'm not able to do this or that. I mean, what are they talking about? Then, then we need to question that because the Holy Spirit, he knows who we are. He knows why we're here, and he knows what he wants to do in our lives. So then we, go, we, we follow that, that, that system there, and we see what we were talking about is control is the thing that that holds all that together. 
So what is the control? I'm not going to do it. I'm going to hide. I'm not going to say much because then they're going to know I, I'm not as smart as, as I think. They will know I'm, I'm not smart because that's what I think about myself. So and that's the lie that the enemy is telling me. So I'm just going to, that control holds that system in place. So this has been in, um, in effect since Adam and Eve in the Bible. Um, Genesis 3.10, the, the voice of the Lord um, came after Adam and Eve. And what, what, they said, where are you? They said, well, we were what? Naked. Yes, right. We were ashamed. So shame first says, I'm a mistake. I'm flawed. I'm bad. I'm ashamed. I'm defective. Or as they said, I was naked. Next fear says, what if they find out? They're not like me. They'll reject me. Well, Adam and Eve said, I was afraid. Then finally control said, I will control everything so they won't find out what I'm really like so I um, will not get hurt or suffer pain. So Adam and Eve hid themselves. And Satan got them to believe the lie that they were not like God, not good enough, which is shame, which led them and leads us to take things into our own hands, which is why they were trying to get themselves some clothes to cover up and figure out how to do it, right? So Satan encourages us to be self-focused when we were born to look Godward. And Satan wants us to think others are aware of every mistake we make and that others are better than us. And so this has been happening. I would love to say that you and I was the only one that went through this. But we're sitting on this stage to say <laughs> that if you're alive and breathing, anybody alive and breathing, yes. that the devil is still trying to cause us to be entrapped with shaming events that happen. And so it's about how we process them and as Donna said, we can overcome life's traumas. Amen. And I'm going to put a little more hope out there, just in case you're wondering, because if you've lived with trauma responses, sometimes you're not even awake to it. You don't notice. You don't know what your body's doing. You don't key into the fact that when so-and-so walks into the room, I tighten up. My shoulders go up. I get that frightened feeling because I'm afraid to say anything because that's the person who has shamed me since I was a little kid or something like that. Proverbs 20, verse 27. The good news is the spirit of man is the lamp of the Lord searching all his innermost parts. All we have to do is what Elder Yvonne said and say, Lord, my shoulders are up. I'm feeling funny in my stomach. I don't know what's going on. What's happening? The lamp of the Lord. We have, as believers, the spirit of God in us. Check in. Check in with your body when you notice some tightness, when you notice that when that happens, I do this, or my body does this, because you want to be awake to what's going on, and the Lord wants you to be awake to what's going on. And the other part of that psych, uh, it's not up there, but the other side that we talked about was the rebellion part of it. And they, like we said before, it goes together. And um, rebellion resists direction or control, even legitimate control. And legitimate control is, you know, like obeying the law, right? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, and but... But there are people in jail because there's legitimate, they, they uh, resist control. We do it in other subtle ways. It can be, we do it in open, the open way is that somebody is going against the law and that's the control in the, in the land. But the other way that we do it is passively. You know, I, you know, I, I say I'm going to do it, but I really don't do it because... I really don't want to do it, but I'm just afraid of what you might say if I don't do it. So I tell you, I will do it so that I can 
you know. <laughs> and, and I think that's the thing that, that we probably, we have to be very, very conscious of, you know. And we talked about this, this whole thing. Uh, we, we probably would think that we know the other part of it is when it goes to rejection, we all know that we can identify some place in our life where we were rejected. Sometimes we, we're not real, we don't realize we can ask God for that place, that original place where we felt the most rejected and allow him to shine the light on that place. Mm -hmm. And then we are able to ask him for forgiveness or ask that person who, who harmed us and that would dismantle that stronghold. And that's what these things we're talking about are strongholds where the enemy has set up camp. And because he has a legal right to do that, then this cycle just keeps going on and on. But the Holy Spirit will show you if you ask him, he is faithful to show you and, and tell you what. Because he want, tells us what it is. Because more than anything, he wants us free. We're not here by accident. He has a plan and a purpose for each one of us. And this is the way that the enemy, remember that we said, he steals our identity. The purpose that God has for us. Um, I, I remember uh, while uh, Donna was talking about a situation I was at Women in Fellowship. And, you know, at the last, last session, they always said, you know, somebody get up and tell what happened. You know, what did the Lord do? <laughs> and so the Lord <laughs> said to me, why don't you get up and tell what the Lord did? I'm like. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you want to say, what you talking about, God? <laughs> Who, me? Who? <laughs> and. Breakthrough came in my life because he said, your problem is you believe I can do anything, all these things with everybody else, but you don't believe that I can do it in you. So I had swallowed that lie. But let me tell you the other part. And so I made a decision that I'm going to obey God. If God asks me to do something, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it scared. But you know what I've learned? I don't have to do it scared. Because God has not given me a spirit of fear. It's like I got a measure of freedom. I began to walk it out. But, you know, over the last few months, the Lord has been showing me that was a measure. I haven't given you a spirit of fear. Love, power, and a sound mind, right? So now it's like, get behind me, Satan. Because you are not my friend. And I'm going to do what God said. And so, you know, I, it's, it's a way, because I thought I was doing all right. Frankly, that's the reason I'm mentioning this, because I thought I was doing all right because I was obeying. <laughs> but God wants us free. He wants more. You know, he wants free. Talk, true obedience is being free. Amen. Right. Amen. Amen. Can I just encourage you by saying that God does not reject us? That's it. John 637 says, I will never... No, never reject one of them who comes to me. So the voice of rejection is not the voice of God. So from the beginning, God has not been in the rejecting business. In fact, man actually rejected God. And Satan got Adam and Eve to think God was not good and also that he was cheap because he kept the best for himself, right? And that he left them without the provision that they needed. And this is why they questioned his words in the garden. So the, the seed of rejection and thus the root of rejection has been with mankind for a very long time. And so God does not condemn or reject us. In fact, he gave his one and be only begotten son so that we could be fully accepted and fully restored by him. And so God desires that we be rooted and grounded in his love like the picture behind us, knowing our acceptance in him 
and becoming trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord. He wants us to get our value, our self-worth, and our significance from him. But if we don't look to him, we will try to find our significance in other things and other people. And so um, the enemy caused Adam and Eve to question. And so um, we want to make sure that we understand that rejection is a kind of communication that originates either from who? Satan or ourselves. Yes. But it does not come from God. Wow, that's good. When you, when you read the scripture about what happened in the garden, Adam and Eve didn't register that God came looking for them. And he called to them. And so when we begin to believe lies that are against God's word, his ways, his nature, we know we're on the path that'll keep us stuck and unfree. And rejection, again, doesn't live alone. It's not by itself. When we reject, when we, when we feel rejected and we live in that, then rebellion's close by. That's the way it works. And when the rebellion comes, then the control, try, again, trying to be our own protector, our own defender, God has that role. So pay attention, pay attention, talk to God, and let his words be true and every other word a lie. So can we talk about some of the causes of rejection? Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. So some of the causes of rejection might be um, you were a child, you were the child your parents didn't want, meaning maybe you're a girl and they wanted a boy. Um, causes of rejection might be adoption mm -hmm. or abandoned in a relationship. Um, parents who neglected because they were working all the time in the military or um, were TDY. Um, maybe you were the child that was not timely, meaning they didn't want to get pregnant when they had you. Um, these are sources of rejection. Uh, being a part of any abusive situation, emotional, uh, physical, spiritual, sexual. Maybe a parent was an alcoholic or had some kind of mental illness or the early death of a parent. Um, being compared to another sibling. Uh, strife in the home, marital rejection, divorce job loss, chronic illness, or parent in and out of the hospital. All of these kind of experiences cause us to feel inferior, to have for, poor self-esteem, guilt, distrust, judgmentalism, hard-heartedness, disrespect, rebellion, anger, bitterness, and competition. In addition, when, when we have these kind of wounds in our lives, we tend to become people pleasers because shaming events and rejecting events cause us to be consumed with what people think about us. So these kinds of events can also cause us to feel like we have to withdraw or decline into everything where love or fear may, love, fearing that love will be withheld from us if we're not doing everything according to how we are projecting um, things might happen. So aren't these kind of like events, like we all know someone, if we haven't been through this ourselves, we all know someone who has suffered severe rejection. And this is why we wanna explain how these kind of things start. Because then not only can we have a mercy on those who are around us because we can recognize that they are hurting, we can also give them and ourselves the invitation to counter God's love. Because again, he is not the source of rejection. Amen. And, and he, again, he's not, the, he's not the source and he's made it available for us to be free. That's the good news. 
You know, we all, it, the enemy is unique in his methods sometimes with us, unique in some areas. I thought, as Apostle was saying, uh, naming those things, I thought color. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, you know, you wouldn't think that if you're in a predominantly uh, black community, a white community, that you could, you could receive prejudices, you know, because of your shade is different than other. And it's not even, it, sometimes it isn't in the community, it's actually within your family, you know? Uh, I spent many years with that in my family. <laughs> I thought I was the same as my sister, but obviously to her I wasn't. So I, it was a source of, it was a source of teasing and teasing and a whole, and so, you know, you wonder where the weight of all these things come from. And sometimes it's like, like this poison being, being shot into your veins from all directions. And, but the good news, no matter what it is, little by little, God can, will evict those things so, and set up a new system within you that is, is like, like I talked about with those post, posters, that is based on uh, the root that the Holy Spirit brings to us, right? We change that root system, no matter what anybody has said, anybody's done, and the pain is there, and we have to walk little by little through that process, but we are being diligent to watch and pray and not just um, be okay, be okay with what, how we behave, be okay with the things that we do to protect ourselves, which is that control area. So with, with hearing where rejection comes from and, and knowing that there is help for that, you may want to know what, what do you look for in yourself? You know, what, what's happening? And, and if, you, if you find that you're having trouble um, functioning at home or at work and, and that's just, you know, it's beyond um, other work issues. Um, if you're suffering fear, anxiety, or depression, um, Apostle Michelle talked about how we can get help. There's help for us. If, if you find yourself having difficulty forming close and satisfying relationships, friendships, and you know, being able to be connected in your family, if you are emotionally numb and disconnected from others, if you come and, and worship is happening and, and you're wondering, I, I can't get it, <laughs> you know? If, if you're avoiding more and more things, knowing you're a believer and, and it's not happening, that's when you might want to get some help. If you are um, using alcohol or drugs or food or shopping or, or other short-term relievers, <laughs> sex even, you know, to feel better in the moment, that's a clue that it's time to ring the help bell, and there is help for, for that. And, and it's important, although we are saying many things uh, in terms of what it could be, but we have to admit also that it's something that we are not always able to do alone. And, and I, you know, none of us have not been in some form where you are. And we are in a good place here. I mean, just a wonderful place to be here at Hope Christian Church with our apostle, yeah. you know. <laughs> and I just wanted to emphasize how much we love you and she loves you. And I, I, I'm not the expert on her heart, but I've, I know a little bit about it, and I know that that she wants to see us free, and she wants to see us walk in the fullness of all that God wants to to see us walk in. But greater than her is Him, and He wants us to be to walk in freedom. And we have here, you know, points of breakthrough. We have the Hope and Healing House. Uh, that uh, is, is set up to minister to each of you. If, if you find yourself in that place where you're stuck, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
And you see this cycle just keeps going around and around, like you see a picture of a wheel and it just keeps going around and around and you see these places where you're not moving, though you have great information. You know, we all of us went through Hope Healing uh, House and I'm older than everybody here and, <laughs> and I went through it. You would thought I was fixed, but let me tell you, I wasn't fixed, I was not fixed. <laughs> And the Holy Spirit has really shined the light on areas that I had no idea about. Although I'm ministering to people all the time. There were areas where they, I, that were hidden to me mm-hmm. that the Holy Spirit uncovered, brought the light to. But there was a desire, what we were talking about is having a desire to be set free, to walk in freedom. And, and be, as Donna can say, being sick and tired of being sick and tired. <laughs> That's what it is. So um, I, I want to put some true identities in the atmosphere because I feel like sometimes when we've gone through some challenging things, we might not know what are some true identities. We might be just consumed with the false ones, right? So let me put some true identities out here. So um, one false identity is that I'm bad, right? So a true identity would be I am righteous. Um, A false identity would be I'm controlling. But a true identity would be I am spirit-led. A false identity would be I am fearful. A true identity would be I'm full of faith. Um, a false identity would be, I am dumb, I am stupid. A true identity would be, I am wise, I am Christ-minded. Um, another false identity, I'm, tr- I'm choosing the ones that are close to the issues we're talking about today. <laughs> um, I am rebellious. A true identity would be, I am obedient, I am submitted. A false identity would be, I am rejected. A true identity would be, I am accepted and loved by God. So the reason I bring these up is because part of walking in freedom is how we also talk to ourselves and talk about ourselves. And a lot of the things that we believe to be true about ourselves have been told to us from people in authority, our parents, our teachers, our loved ones, people who we trust have told us things that are not true. And so taking, a, taking stock of those things and really thinking about how do I describe myself? Am I describing myself in reaction to who God says I am or am I describing myself in reaction to the things that I've been through or the things that people have said about me. All of that is the process of renewing the mind, of walking it out, walking in your true identity. That reminds me of Colossians 3, 9 through 10. It says, seeing that we have put off the old man with his deeds and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him who created him. So that's, that's really, you know, uh, Apostle was mentioning the process of renewing your mind to what the Word says about you. And what we've learned also, it's important to write it down, to really begin to journal, you know, to identify. We do this in self-confrontation. What is it that you need to put off? Mm-hmm. All the things that you're, you're thinking or doing that you need to put on put off and then what are you going to put on in its place and and writing that down and monitoring it having like an open uh journal that you're constantly putting that information in so that your mind is renewed we we also learn it takes 60 days to to really get it into your your spirit what the truth is versus a lie that you uh, you have believed so we're talking about habits. When you have a habit of doing something, you need to be 
as as diligent to introduce the new habit. So even the the false identity being put off and the new identity being put on, think of a way you can do that. You get dressed every day. We do get dressed every day. If we're not getting dressed every day, that may be a time to call a professional counselor because something's going on. I mean, yeah, honestly, this is, this is us paying attention to ourselves, right? Yeah. And there are times when people have trouble getting up and, and maybe need that extra help and, and can call a, a professional counselor for that. But in order to, to move into the new, we have to do that process in Colossians. We take off and we put on. So when you're getting dressed, make that a time where you're like, oh, wait, this is my identity. Let me put this on. And with every piece of clothing you put on, call out who you are. You know, I was just amazed at, at walking through a fresh dose of healing. And the scripture in 1 John just really just filled my soul when the, the, John wrote, I have come to know and believe the love God has for me. You know, I probably read that a lot of times, and I probably rolled it off my tongue even many more times. But when I had this freedom and this healing, wow, even now when I say that, I'm like, there's a point in time where I have come to know and believe the love God has for me. That's a new garment, and that's a garment I can walk out in. Hallelujah. I want to agree with you, and everybody should take this as a note. This is what my mom told me growing up. If ever there comes a time in your life that you cannot get up, brush your teeth, comb your hair, and put on clean clothes, call somebody and get some help. Because that means that we're in a place that we don't know where we are. So we can all, we all have circumstances <laughs> that can take us there, you know, but we have our sisters in Christ to help us when we get to that place, okay? So I just wanted to say that. Couple uh, wanted to bring this up. Um, hold on, I got to find my note, hold on. Hold on, don't be mad. Okay. We're talking about dismantling the cycle in our lives. So what we're doing today is bringing recognition and acknowledgement of how shame, fear, and control can operate in our lives. So we're, we're, high, we're shining a light and saying, okay, this is not meant to be the Christian experience, right? And then secondly... How we dismantle and stop the cycle in our lives is to recognize that there's no need to hide from God. So that's what we see in Genesis is that God went after Adam and Eve. And so he's coming after us. But if we're still choosing to hide because we believe we have to, we want to recognize that today is an invitation to no longer hide from God but to recognize that he cares for us, he loves us, and he wants to help us, and the Holy Spirit will help us to walk in the freedom, and that Jesus is not ashamed of us. Amen. For the joy that was set before him, he willingly went to the cross for the things of the past, the things of our present, and the things in our future. So he doesn't have any shame regarding you, me, anybody, and um, we can walk free, and we can, we can use the power of God to allow us to repent, renounce, break any covenant or agreement, and the Lord will help us to know who we are in him. He wants to do that, so we've got to begin to believe that he wants to help us and that he wants to see us live free, whole, and with him. Amen. Amen. And, you know, I would venture to say that he wants us to know that we need him and that he's there. 
yeah. that this responsibility that we can take on that says that we have to do it ourselves is a lie. Mm -hmm. Do we have to walk, walk the walk, walk it out? Yes, we do. You know, do we have to be consistent? Do we have to be consistent <laughs> in that process of walking it out? Yes, because it's the consistency that the enemy plants that seed, and be, when we latch onto it, it's that <coughs> consistency that keeps that cycle going over and over again. So in the opposite direction, we need to go the opposite direction and putting on the new beliefs. That's what we're talking about because that's what holds it in place, that ungodly belief is, what, is one of the ways that it keeps staying there. So now that we have new information, we have to be just as determined, just as consistent to make sure that something new has to happen. But in our weakness, God is made strong. Because in that moment, we are weak. You know, I mean, we are definitely weak. We need him. But we, we keep sliding back because the secrecy is a way to hide. That's Don't right. tell anybody. Yes. Don't tell anybody. And, and so just recognizing that is what's happening and make a decision that he comes first. When we decide that he comes first, then it changes our perspective about being free. If he comes first... We want to please him. We want to grow in him. We want to be all that he has to be, want us to be. And if anything is keeping that from happening, then I'm sorry about y'all, but I need to be free. You know, because he, he's the one I'm going to live with forever. You know, so I want to have done what I need to do while I'm here. So just putting things in order in terms of perspective. Who is first? He's not calling me. to. He's daddy. He's daddy. And if you want to do good for your children, what more will he do for his children? So we can come boldly before the throne of grace and share, ask for whatever we need. And frankly, he's blessed when we recognize that. What he tells us to return to our first, our first love. That's him. He wants us to come back. He wants us to come back and just recognize that he's daddy. And you can come boldly to talk to him about anything, and he's there to help you. And you, when we say, for, for, uh, Lord, forgive me, he doesn't remember it anymore. Thank you, Daddy. Thank you, Daddy. Well, there's a, a really neat example of what Elder Yvonne was talking about. At the beginning of the pandemic, remember when things shut down, I, I just said, oh, God, I, I just need you. I noticed I was paying attention to my body. And I noticed that I was stressed. I noticed that I was eating when I wasn't hungry. And I was um, just, just really tight. I talk about the shoulders a lot because that's what happens in my body. And I got to know, oh, this is what it is. And I learned sitting in a chair in my basement was my place to talk to God during that time. And I developed a new habit I, I called breath prayer. How many of us know that breathing is a good thing. Inhale, exhale. Well, I took Psalm 23, and I began to use it as a breath prayer. And it's a habit I have that I can do this breath prayer, and no one would ever know that I'm accessing my Father God in the midst of whatever I'm in. And just one example of that, I'll take the first line. I would inhale it, the Lord is my shepherd, and I'd exhale I have everything I need. And just imagine, I'm just inhaling and exhaling, but inhaling the truth, exhaling the truth. My shoulders were looking pretty good. <laughs> I didn't have that shoulder pad look or a football player all dressed up for, for the game. And I started to see that difference in my body. Going out for a walk, I started doing beauty hunting. Because our God says the earth is his and the fullness of it. So I suspected that if I moved my body, I got out of bed. <laughs> if I moved my body and I looked for what was in his world, it would make a difference. So it did. The flowers, the, the little, little green greenery coming through the cracks of cement. What? That can happen? Yeah, it can happen. There's beauty 
that God has given us to see. And so just to encourage you, this isn't theoretical for us, and you can access it as well. Amen. So we went through a little, a few of um, rejecting events, but I thought it would be important for us to talk about shaming events too, because by putting them out in the open, then we can kind of see and know, oh yeah, no, that was traumatic. You know, or oh yeah, that was a shaming event. So um, any form of physical or emotional abandonment is a shaming, can, can produce shame or a shame identity in our life. Um, if you have ever been the scapegoat in your family, you may feel that it is your fault and internalize that I am bad because you've been blamed for things you didn't do or didn't know about. And so that can, be, can produce a shame, um, a shame identity. Um, being physically or spiritually or sexually abused um, can have an, a lingering effect on how you think about others and how they are supposed to protect you especially if you were um, told not to tell or told um, that it was your fault. Shame can be produced also from poverty because other people have, and maybe you were having free and reduced lunch at school and you didn't have food at home, and so that can cause shame. Any kind of loss of status, such as financial loss, can produce shame because people feel humiliated or put down based on that experience. Right. Um, growing up in any type of family where there's a pattern of, of addiction can cause us to not be able to have friends over, right? So then it's like, well, everybody else, I'm ashamed of where, who my family is or where I'm growing up because of what's happening at home. Um, a cross-cultural marriage or a cross-racial marriage, parents and or children can cause us to feel ashamed. What happens if you don't approve of who your children married? Or you're in a marriage where you know your parents-in-law or your parents don't approve of your marriage? That is a shaming event and can produce a shame-based identity. Also, any time you feel different, how we process our difference can cause us to feel um, ashamed. Maybe you're not athletic. Maybe there are parts of your body that's not perfect. Um, Apostle was talking, Apostle Nesbitt was talking about BBLs and all that. We live in a, uh, <laughs> come on. We live in a society they're talking about it all the time. So we can talk about it in church. Amen. Um, but those can be reasons why we compare ourselves to others. Weight, how healthy we are. Is it organic? You know, are you on intermittent fasting? I mean, these all are topics, right? So how we feel about ourselves and our bodies can make us feel ashamed. What about a speech issue? If you have a stutter or you get on stage or in public, public speaking, that can be an issue that causes shame. Too short, too fat, too dumb, too smart. All of these kind of things that we sometimes believe ourse about ourselves, live in the wrong neighborhood, all of those kind of things can produce shame, shame identity. And so it's important for us to look up and to focus on the Lord and, and process the things that happen in our life through his filter. Well, um, I don't know where we are. Uh, uh, we, the, the first thing that we do, how do we walk out of it? Uh, Donna talked about some of that. And, uh, and uh, one way, we want to we wanna break legal agreement with those things. We, we identify it, and we call it what it is, sin, a lie. We, we remember where the, the source of that thing came from. And then we begin, that we ask God's forgiveness, and we forgive those who we need to forgive. And then we, it breaks agreement with that thing. Mm -hmm. 
it's amazing that that sounds pretty simple. But, you know, it's only because Jesus has already paid the price. We don't have to do anything but appropriate what he's already done for us. And that's how we ex access that. And I just wanted to just say there's some scriptures that will be on this, this next slide that will just remind you of how much God wants us whole and healed. In case you were feeling such shame that you didn't think he wanted you healed. <laughs> but it's true. He came to heal the brokenhearted. He binds up wounds. You probably can get to the scripture quicker than the one in James, but the, um, mm -hmm. that they, um, oh, the Philip's well, yeah, yeah, there you go. Oh, uh, oh, the, the, the passion, the passion, is a passion, it's a passion. passion. Yeah, let's see, either one. I think it's one, two, three, Dear brothers and sisters, when, ye, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow, for when your endurance is fully developed, you will be complete, perfect, needing nothing. Amen. Amen. Here it is in the Passion. My fellow believers, when it seems as though you're facing nothing but difficulties, see it as an opportune, as an invaluable opportunity to experience the greatest joy that you can. For you know that when your faith is tested, it stirs up power within you to endure all things. And then as your endurance grows, even stronger, it will release perfection into every part of your being until there is nothing missing and nothing lacking. When all kinds of trials and temptations crowd into your lives, my brothers, do not resent them as intruders, but welcome them as friends. Realize that they come to test your faith and to produce in you the quality of endurance. But let the process go on until that endurance is fully developed and you will find you have become men of mature women of mature character with the right sort of independence. And if in the process any of you does not know how to meet any particular problem. She has only to ask God who gives generously to all women without making them feel foolish, guilty, and she may be sure that the necessary wisdom will be given to her. The Phillips translation. James 1, 2 through 5. It's training your hands for war. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about governing our bodies, right? <laughs> I thought all this, everything is going to come together in this mm -hmm. whole process. Um, do you have uh, any questions? Or mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I think Donna has one thing that you no. want to No, I'm good for now. <laughs> <laughs> um, there, uh, we, we wanted to give you the opportunity to ask questions, if, if you like. Hello. <laughs> can, I, um, can I have you? I was hoping that you would talk about that cycle of, because um, you talked about the fear and the rejection, but what, can you talk a little of the symptoms of rebellion and what that, what that looks like, that part of it? You want me to be sure? <laughs> um, how do I? Uh, rebellion is knowing what the rule is, knowing what the the what you should do, but going in the opposite direction. 
I would say is probably the simplest way to put that. Yeah, you know, examples of? We're, we're just about to do that. Um, I feel rejected by my husband because he ignored something. And so the rebellious act is that I kind of block him out of some things very nicely. You know, not screaming or yelling, but, you know, Absolutely. just kind of creating a world over here for myself. Uh, not speaking, you know. Uh, you know what, you didn't do what I wanted you to do, but you know what, talk to the hand. <laughs> Um, time to think of one. Yeah. What, what, are, what are the things I wanted to ask about? Sometimes we have the situation where we're going through a trauma with someone, and that actually impacts you as your own trauma. Mm -hmm. It's almost like you get double whammy. Mm -hmm. How do you have, like, you have, I guess it would be It's, it's definitely secondary trauma, but it could be touching off on trauma that's yours yeah. as well, right? So you want to take care of yourself, and that's when you get help for yourself and um, address some of the maybe unseen issues that are going on with you, with that person. Because our reaction to a situation kind of gives us some evidence of what's going on in us as well. Yes, so, I, so what, what happens when you're working with someone or living with someone or caring for someone and they are through their trauma uh -huh. and then you begin to experience some trauma. It's not necessarily from the past, but it's connected with your caregiving, perhaps. You still have to address what it's doing in you in that time, so, so really understanding what's, what's your body saying to you, you know, um, and, and addressing that. And generally that is when you call a friend <laughs> or, or, or get some help to help you in that moment. I've been a caregiver. I've been a caregiver at different points in my life. And I remember a time when I was helping a friend whose baby was born um, with a lot of health issues. And I remember that at that time, while I was helping her with the trauma, what I was feeling actually touched on some trauma in my life that I wasn't aware was happening. And I needed help and sought help for just feelings of anger that were in me. I was there for my friend, but it triggered something. And we never know what that precisely is, which is why we get help and asking the Lord to help us look inside to see what we need. To be, to, to be healed from or free from. So circling back to the rebellion issue, rebellion really deals with like the brokenness of heart and rebellion is, is typically rooted in rejection of some kind. So the rebellion is actually in, re, in reaction to the rejection that we either perceive, we think, is happening or that we expect to happen. Um, and so what ha what's happening when someone is rebelling, it's actually that they are um, seeking to not be hurt again or rejected again, right? And so rebellion looks like self-reliance I don't need anybody to help me, I got this, right? Which is why I broke agreement with the strong black woman narrative. 
Okay. But anyway, that's a whole nother session. <laughs> okay. Independence or separation from relationships can often be um, a root of rejection. So we become defensive. So that, that is actually rebellion, right? So we sometimes think rebellion means we just have a bad attitude or we just don't want to go with the flow. But instead of being able to like honor authority and even submit, that can, that's rebellion. When we have challenges with authority, it's typically because there's rejection of some kind. There's a wounding with authority that's there that causes us not to be, to feel distrustful and even to believe like I'm not safe if I submit, right? So all of that, all of that brokenness fuels the, the rebellion, which is I'm just going to resist, right? So resistance uh, in rebellion doesn't always look like King Kong, I'm bad, <laughs> you know, aggressive. It can also be passive aggressive. It can also be withdrawal, like silent treatment until, right? So, does that help? Yeah. Can you explain it a little better in relation to God, like lawlessness, like a lawlessness and rebellion in terms of God? Because in, in, in the word it says, Rebellion is lawlessness. Is there any way you can clarify it? So, Mama T saying, can you clarify a little bit more? So, we've been talking in terms of relationships, right? How rebellion works um, in, in, in response to rejection. But rebellion is also lawlessness. So, Romans 13 tells us that every authority has been placed by God, right? And so when we do rebel, we open ourselves up for a spirit of lawlessness to be in operation in our lives, right? So in relation to God, when, we're, when we are having um, this issue of rejection and rebellion, what it causes us to do is not receive that God is accepting us, and then it causes us to reject his intervention. Right, and to rebel against the way he would do things by relying on ourselves, by being independent, by relying on our own wisdom and our own way of doing things instead of submitting to God's way. So when we are operating that way, what James says um, in that in that in that chapter that we went to was that we're actually we're actually not qualified to receive anything from God because we're halting we're wavering between two opinions and so when we ask for something from God we need to ask Him in faith right and be solid that He has the answer so when we break agreement from um, rebellion, what we're saying is that we're willing to submit to God's way of doing things, and then we walk in obedience with what that looks like. So it may look different for you in your circumstances, in the example that our sister was giving about interacting with other people's trauma, like, and, and walking in our own freedom, obedience may look like listening to the Holy Spirit about what's coming up for me as I'm ministering to you. As we sit on this stage, we've all been through shaming events, rejecting events, and we're walking out our freedom, right? While ministering to others. And at times there can be issues that we're going through and then you're finding you're ministering to someone who's like you're like literally like maybe a step maybe a toe in front of them in the process right and so it's like holy spirit you've got to show up and interact with me about how do i minister to them but also walk forward in what and what i'm and what i'm living in How do you relate to God when you're dealing with religious trauma? So is that spiritual abuse? Okay. So I, I first have to say, before anybody answers, and it's, this is not a judgment on you because this is a big, hot topic in the body of Christ right now. 
there is a need for accountability for what we do and for sin to be called sin. So for people to be held accountable for their actions is not always abuse. So it, 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 I want to say that from the outside first, and then we can talk about unhealthy spiritual control over others because that is abusive. But um, we do have to get to a place where we are willing to allow the word to confront us and for um, the, the word, the, 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 the integrity of the scriptures to be upheld and for us to be living in an environment where we can uh, say, yeah, I did, fall, I did backslide, I did sin, I was wrong, and repent and live in a place where the body can restore others, where we just don't throw people out because they sinned. Okay. So I just wanted to say that first. <laughs> it's important to have that, that first word. Yeah. <laughs> but it's... You reach out for the help. So it, here, this Hope Healing House can help with um, this uh, issue-focused ministry can really help with what the issue is. Because oftentimes, what we see, there's we see the tip of the iceberg, even within ourselves. And so being able to go through ministry enables God to illuminate what's the nine-tenths of the iceberg below the surface. So seeking ministry help for that. Mm -hmm. I, I, I agree with that. I don't, I don't know what else I can say. But, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, um, and this is partly directed at Donna in particular about our nervous system. So, how do we, since we talked in the beginning about healing as a process and it's a journey and it takes time and maybe it never ends, I don't know. But how do you measure that you're actually moving in the right direction? Because um, one of the things, Donna, you were talking about was the, the, our bodies. And I know for sure, I'm just speaking for myself, my body tells me, oh, you remember this and this causes you to feel fear. And you don't want to ever experience that again. And so I feel progress in the awareness of it, and I'm able to manage that. But at the same time, I'd kind of like not to feel it at all. I'd like to say, oh, this doesn't even affect me. Um, so I know there's healing, but how do you really measure? Like, am I getting better? Or, you know, are we doing the right things? I hope that, hopefully that question makes that sense. That is such a great question. Thank you for that question. I actually came prepared with an answer, but not knowing I would get the question. <laughs> but um, there is a way to measure. So I'm going to talk um, not in depth, um, but I'm going to give some information about how we process emotions. Because that's essentially what the place where we can measure our progress. And I'll talk about the window of tolerance. We all have like an optimum like window where we can process what's going on and where we can think and feel um, at our best. And then there are times when we, we are out of that window, so we are either hyper-aroused in our emotions and we fight, we, we flee away, or we fawn, and I'll tell you what that is in a minute, or we are almost shut down and so hypo aroused, that's outside of that window of tolerance. And we need to understand what that is. We can grow in expanding our window of tolerance. So the hyper aroused is when there's the um, freeze or the withdrawal of situations. The f How many of you have heard of fight and flight response? So that's, that's outside of your window of tolerance. Something happens and you're like, what? <laughs> or, or you run away, or you fawn. I'm very familiar with fawning. Fawning is pleasing, oh, codependent. Like, well, well, I'll just make, I'll do this. I'll, I'll, I'll make this better. I'll do what I can do. I'll perform so that people are pleased, and then that'll tamp down that. Doesn't work. Um, and it's outside of the window of tolerance. 
and then, and then the freeze. So there are ways that you can grow your window of tolerance. I have been triggered about something emotionally in the midst of a counseling session. It would be a little bit of a problem if I ran out the door. <laughs> it would be a bigger problem ethically if I start fighting with somebody in the room. It would be unethical if I just sit back and just shut down, like, I can't do this. What do I do? In my window of tolerance, I've learned to put brackets around that triggering thing that really wasn't something they did. It was something I responded to and just say, I'll get back to that, right? I'll get back to that, and I do get back to it. But in the moment, I've been able to grow that tolerance. I've seen being able to grow that. It's intentional, and I can give you more information about that. Thanks for that question. You know, the, the other thing that I thought about, because I, I, I'm, I'm the fear girl, so that's the thing the Lord has delivered me from, uh, is I'm continuing to walk out. And I remember, I don't know, uh, well, it was a long time ago because Bishop prophesied. He, he, he came to me and he said, you think that because you have, have forgiven or, or have uh, walked out of some of this area of fear that you don't have anything anymore left. <laughs> And he explained that it was a, a process. The, the picture I have for that process is just l looking at the onion. Just think of an onion. And, and God in his mercy, he, he, I, I love this little by little idea that he, he delivers us little by little. And, and I understand that in that process there are layers and he, you know, as he reveals, then you, you, t you present it to him and forgive that part. Just because you have forgiven an aspect of it doesn't mean that the, com the job has been completed totally. But it's that you are being diligent in the process of being unraveling that onion altogether. So then when the Holy Spirit, if we say, if, if ouch comes out of your mouth, then there's another layer. Yeah. Um, the and you can ask the Lord. The huh? onion being peeled always makes you cry. <laughs> I'm telling That's you. That's true. In the natural, it does. That's true. And uh, that's so true. That's a good, a good picture there. But, the, you know, just thinking of that as a process and that you're going through each these levels, and, at, and one day as you're being diligent to allow God to shine the light on that area, you will find that that ouch doesn't come. The tears don't come. You, it's on you there, but it's, the tears doesn't come. You're giving me hope. <laughs> <laughs> huh? Oh, okay. I'll, can you explain to me what, the, what do you um, mean? Sometimes it's like if I'm really upset or if I'm talking, I'm I have a loud voice. Um, I have mental blackouts where sometimes I have a conversation with some people and it could be random conversation and I won't remember the conversation before. Uh, when I was younger, if I got in a fight that I don't remember the fight. Mm -hmm. All I know, I just hurt someone, and I just don't remember how do I deal with that. You know, I would suggest that's a great opportunity for uh, Hope a Healing House, but but it, it can be a defense mechanism. It could be, you know, a way of protecting yourself or, you know, not being further harmed. So, I don't know if you... Yeah. No. What if I hurt someone? And Well, I did when I was in a fight, mm -hmm. but I didn't, don't remember. Mm -hmm. So, it's, it's probably buried pretty deeply, but I would say that it's a great opportunity it for open is. house. It definitely, I would definitely say you should sign up for Issue Focus yeah. Ministry because we wouldn't be able to yeah. identify and help in like this kind of setting. Um, but as I was about to call you Donna, this is Donna. 
That's funny. <laughs> Elder Yvonne. <laughs> as Elder Yvonne was saying, there are, there are some things that our body and our mind does in order to protect us when we're going through traumatic events. So um, sometimes we don't remember things that happened and bystanders tell us certain things that happened because your body is designed for you to survive. So it's not something to be ashamed about, but since you're, um, the Holy Spirit is bringing it to your attention, it's something that you can receive ministry for, and we are equipped to do that and would be able to help you. So it's like, oh, oh. <laughs> uh, so how do you deal with that? It's like experiencing new trauma, and then now you're revisiting some of the old. Even though you might have had some breakthrough in the old, but now the new can be so overwhelming that you really don't want to visit that old right now. Mm -hmm. So how do you deal with that? Can you give some examples? Mm -hmm. Well, I think the, the biggest example is that's one of those cries for help, <laughs> Like your mother, Apostle Michelle said, when you can't do some things, when you're, when you're dealing with that, think about that. You need some help. You need, you need to make sure that you're in a place where you can process that. And there are a couple of ways to do that through ministry and through professional counseling. I can, I can give you a personal example. Um, so when my mother died in 2018, it was four years after my grandmother had died. And my grandmother actually helped to raise us because when we first moved to Maryland, um, my parents were the senior pastors of this church. So when we first moved to Maryland, we sold my childhood home where I had lived and grown up. And because of the financial circumstances of the ministry, which my parents didn't know in advance, we were kind of displaced. So that's a shaming event. We just talked about that, right? financial, right? So you go from being able to have your own home, your own room, to sharing a room, to not having enough, to eating out of the food pantry, all these things, right? So my grandmother became a second mother to us because our parents had to stabilize the church. And they, had, they were missing a lot because they were ministering to other people's families. So this is typical for pastor's kids, right? So a lot of people talk about pastor's kids are always bad. Well, there's a lot of reasons behind that. But anyway, <laughs> um, not part of the story. So 2014, my grandmother dies, right? So that's like my first maternal loss. And I was completely shattered. It is nine years this year. And grief is still present at times. Okay, so I was completely shattered. I could not work. I had to go from full time to part time, or like 30 hours, I think it is, because um, the grief, the waves of grief that I felt, the abandonment that I felt, because that person had been so present for me. Okay, so that's 2014. So 2018, my mother passes away. Well, now I can't get out of bed because I didn't fully lean into the process in 2014. So I would go to Grief Share. We didn't have it at our church at the time, but I would drive to the church, and these two ladies that had the same name, I would sit outside the building, and the meeting was supposed to start at 7 o'clock. I'd be sitting in my car at 645. I'd sit there, and they would say, are you coming inside? Well, that was my intention, right? But I didn't have the emotional capacity to really process everything that was happening in my life. And at that time, the reason I knew I had to get help was because I got in conflict with another leader in the church. Because they were trying to help me and they were trying to give me advice about how I should grieve and how I should handle it and this and that. And I was what? 
touchy. <laughs> Leave me alone. I don't need you. I don't need you to help me. I'm not asking you for help. So how, how am I sitting here now? It's because I started the process of dealing with it one step at a time, one day at a time. Now it shows up for me. Mother's Day was hard this year. So I'm still a little tender, right, in this moment. Because that just passed. But I had incredible influence in my life that mothered me, that shaped me, that made me the woman that I am today. So the grief part of it is normal, right? But how you process it, how you, the things you believe about yourself as you're grieving, those things matter. And like I said before, if you can't get out the bed, if you can't comb your hair and put on clean clothes, if you're sitting at home and you ain't brushed your teeth, <laughs> and you haven't combed your hair, and if somebody was to stop by your house and you would, you would act like you weren't home, something's wrong, and you need, and you need to find help. So I say all that to say that every time you have a grief or you have a loss, you have to process that because if you don't, then the new one does trigger the old one. So um, we went through a thing in our family where we sold my grandmother's house probably close to when she passed away. And when I went through ministry, because we've all been through Hope Healing House, right? So when I went through ministry the third time in training, <clears throat> the, the sale of the house, what came up for me was being displaced because that became my childhood home and the trauma and the loss of place of relocating here with my family. And so the enemy was trying to use the sale of that house to put a root of bitterness or offense in the family for me. But the issue really was all the stuff I just explained to you in five minutes, right? Which was um, 30 something years ago that we moved here, that my parents took on the church and all of the, the shaming and traumatic events that went along for me and my sister when we moved here, right? We were completely displaced and moved into a new thing and God did a work and hallelujah, thank you Jesus. He prospered the church, he blessed my parents. Our situation of loss turned around into gain because what we give to God, right, what does he do? He multiplies it. Right? And so sometimes we want to say, we want to we put a name on the story before it's over. Right? And so God was in the process of restoring my family. But in the snapshot of one season, one moment, we can allow the enemy to, to tell the whole story. And the whole story has a name that's not the true name of what God was up to. So I think that's a little bit of how you would process what those specific traumas are. You may need to um, have a counselor come alongside you or go through Hope Healing House to allow the Holy Spirit to illuminate to you those areas where the enemy wants to keep you in deception and to keep you in grief because there is natural grief but there's also demonic grief, right? So if I were dealing with demonic grief right now, I wouldn't be able to talk to you about any of this. But to shed a tear over the women that raised me that are in heaven now, that's normal, right? So we have to, we have to be open and be willing to categorize and to characterize ourselves from, from God's perspective. I hope that helps. Any other questions before we close in prayer? Go ahead. Hi. Um, so I don't know if it would be easier to bring the little chart forward, but I've just been, I'm not super like a, I'm not a plant mom or anything like that. So I'm doing my best to understand these, like um, the sap, the root, the branch, the fruit, the ground, like how it's all working. And it seems like this is a really good um, kind of formula or pathway to not only be able to deduce for yourself what roots are underlying and coming out in your behavior, but with the people around you and having a, a God-minded compassion for them and what they're going through. If I were to able to understand a little bit more where it comes from, I feel like uh, 
that would just uh, be you'll beneficial. You'll be able to c come up here and take a picture of it. Yeah. Uh, that won't be a problem. Um, yeah. Uh, the soil is your heart, which is we. And when you look, uh, you can't see it, but the heart being your your mind, what you think, how you see yourself at the root, what what damage has been done uh, uh, in your life that's created a root that is not one that would. Uh, it's ungodly, it doesn't, it's not according to the word. So then as a result of that root, just as we think about a natural tree, uh, what, is, what is at the root is what you expect to see as fruit. So uh, if I planted a, a tree, an orange tree, I'm from Florida, <laughs> uh, I expect to see some oranges now. But if I'm up here, you know, if I start seeing a apples, I have to get there because we don't have apples, you know. <laughs> but anyway, that the, then you see all the fruits that are there is some of the things that we've actually talked a lot about today. Now, some of them, these are, uh, might be a little different, but you see uh, from that tree that is, is not according to the Word of God is uh, self-rejection. Anger and depression, fear, guilt, hate, murder, pride, suspicion, bitterness, resentment, jealousy, competition, independence, stubbornness, poor self-image, defensiveness, hang-up, self-pity. And, and that, that just above the tree root, there's the word says seed, and it's deception, Lies told by Satan made to look like truth. Then on the other hand is what we want to really leave here with. is what it looks like when Christ is at the root. When the Holy Spirit, we have Holy Spirit, uh, Jesus. Uh, we have the mind of Christ. Then we see, and we are operating according to the word. Uh, we see love, the fruit of the spirit. Love, peace, kindness, faith, self-control, patience, goodness, long-suffering, and joy. Can I just say one thing that we say in the ministry room <laughs> about the deception? The lies told by Satan to make look like the truth. Mm -hmm. So God does not want you to live your life based on the facts of your situation, but rather based on the truth of his word. So anything that we're believing that is not consistent with his nature, his character, and his word is deception. Mm -hmm. So those things that we believe become the seed. So like I was saying, yeah, when my parents moved here and they sold everything they had to take on the ministry and all of that, 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 was a, that could be a shaming event, right? Where we feel humiliated by that. But instead, we didn't believe the deception. We believed that God had called us to make a sacrifice for a greater destiny and a call and an anointing to birth and pastor a church. And what would have happened had my parents believed that, that lie? There would be no church. Literally, thousands of people in this region that have been blessed by this ministry because the first woman who was pastoring this church died. So had my parents believed the lie, it would have dismantled their ministry. So it's important that we recognize that Satan is trying to get us to agree with him yeah. instead of the truth of what God is saying. And so those seeds of deception, he's hoping that some fruit is going to take root in our lot or the seed is going to take root and produce all this type of fruit so that it then begins to dominate and choke out the life of the good things that God wants for us. 
And if he can cause, if he can't get us to sin as believers, then he wants to try to derail, dismantle, and cause you to disavow your purpose. So it's very important that we recognize what are the lies that we're believing because that's Satan's ammunition and also his access to us personally that gives him legal access and right to be present. When you notice a seed of deception um, kind of like pop up for you, is a good time to address it on your own? Like with God is when it's taking root in that soil, like you, you kind of feel it in your heart, but it's not part of your identity yet. Would you say like there's a process you can go through by yourself? Yes, it's a process that you can go through by yourself. It's called repentance. It's not based on a feeling. Come on, somebody. It's not based on a... You don't have to feel like you need to do something about it to do it. You don't even have to feel like it's right because it's the truth of how God works. So if you, if you notice that there is a lie or a deception that's at work, all you need to do is say, God, I recognize that I am not living out of your truth. I repent. I break agreement with this lie. Now, if you don't know what to believe, then you can say, Holy Spirit, show me what I need to believe to be true. And he'll take you to the word. He may remind you of something that he's already told you. But yes, this is something you don't need somebody else. But if it's a more complicated issue like what you were talking about, where other you might need, you might need somebody else to help you. But for what you're talking about, no. Repent. Mm -hmm. Change your mind. Choose to agree with God. What he is highlighting, he's ready to heal. Just come into agreement with him. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You can take pictures. We won't take it down or anything. You can take pictures of it. somebody who's indirectly um, in a child's life, how can we take these tools and utilize it so that we don't have a group of children who have to deal with all this root? I mean, what things can we say, can we do, can we teach other than teaching the gospel of truth and deal with real issues? Invite every one of their parents to come for issue focused ministry. Seriously, because it impacts generations. I, no, you're correct. I do believe that because having worked in children's ministry, you find that you have to minister to the parents as well as the children. So, yes, I, I do understand take, what you're and saying. And take Pastor Thelma's class <laughs> on I, biblical worldview. Honestly, I, that's what I would say. I would say try to, as best you can, minister to their parents because they're, like, they're under the authority of their parents. And so as much as we want to, um, you know, say, oh, they shouldn't have to be in that family. Well, God, God put them there. Every child was given to a parent by God right? And so we have to learn to like support the parents, help the parents, champion the parents where we have the open door with them and, you know, win, win them. And so that, that's something that I would definitely um, recommend because even in our ministry, if we, um, if we have a parent that wants us to minister to their minor child, We'll do that as long as they want to receive ministry because they're the main spiritual voice in their child's life and they've got to walk it out and help disciple their child. So, um, yeah. Okay, and I have a second question. We've been talking a lot about Hope Healing House and the ministries that are here. Um, is there like a number of sessions that people go to? Do you find that you're... You can be there for whatever, 25 years. I mean. <laughs> at, the end, at the end, we, at the end we're going to give you our calling card. We'll explain what we do, all that. <laughs> but not 25 years. I, I'm going to put a cap on that. 
Oh, that was good. And I'm just wondering where that fits. I know it's over there where the decep seed of deception is, but I just don't know if that's a part of fear or what it is. It could be a part of fear. Yeah, rejection, which sets up that hope. Well, that's the other side of it. Uh, yeah, rejection. Um, yeah, but it's definitely on that other tree over mm -hmm. there. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm working on my, my work, paperwork. <laughs> <laughs> Um, thank you for everything that you have poured into us. I just have a question about uh, deliverance ministry. Um, you've been talking about when to know you are inside the window, outside the window, when we can talk to the Lord ourselves and when we need counseling. But how does deliverance ministry fit in and when is that necessary? Right, right now, I would say hope. Uh, what is it? Hope, hope Healing House is is the name of deliverance too. You know what I'm saying? Deliverance comes through that process. And you know, you need it. I think that it was said earlier when you're living and breathing. <laughs> and 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 the reason I say that is because when we know that. Our forebears, Adam and Eve, like this, this shaping in iniquity and this setup to distrust God is part of the of humankind. Yeah, and um, and honestly, it's it's a way to live fully, and so it's it's an invitation, I think, from the Lord to live fully. I will say this, since you opened the door, <laughs> if you're experiencing nightmares, if you're experiencing insomnia, if you're experiencing sexual dreams, um, if you're experiencing um, terrors, if you're experiencing panic attacks, if you're experiencing um, suicidal thoughts, all of those are opportunities that you should uh, overwhelming oppression, overwhelming dread. Um, you're in your bed at night and something's holding you down. Deliverance. All right, so let's talk about Hope Healing House and close out in prayer. Um, you want to talk about why we started Hope Healing House? You want me to do it? You got it. <laughs> <laughs> so we wanted to start Hope Healing House because we wanted um, deliverance and freedom ministry to be a part of the culture of our church. And so what we have done is we've established a partnership with a ministry that is headquartered in Nashville, Tennessee, called Restoring the Foundations. You can actually Google them or go on their website and get a little bit of their history. But we have about 12 people here in our church that offer issue-focused ministry. So what is issue-focused ministry? Because it's come up today. We take one issue. And we minister to you in Restoring the Foundation's four-part integrated approach. We minister to the sins of the Father and resulting curses. We know that we all come from a family. We have to come through a mother and a father, right? to get here, which means there are generations behind us that had a struggles, propensities, and they did sin. And so those sins, according to Leviticus, affect our lives. And so we want to be able to close the door, 
to those issues that our ancestors had, as well as repent for the sins that we've committed ourselves. So that's the first way we minister to you. We also deal with ungodly soul ties, word curses, vows, and judgments. Then the second part of this integrated approach is kind of what we were talking about today, false identity, ungodly beliefs. What are we believing about this issue that is not in agreement with God's word, his way, and his nature? We minister to that. Then we give you an opportunity for some soul spirit healing. Where did the pain begin? The Holy Spirit wants and desires to reveal to you where things began so that he can pour out healing in that area so that you don't have to live triggered. You don't have to live um, with an open area for the enemy to access your life. And then the last step of the process is ministry to demonic oppression. And we cast all the spirits out that were ministered to that were attached to the issue that you are dealing with. So you're welcome. You're invited to sign up for ministry. All you have to do is send an email to the following email address or call the church office and you can sign up for ministry. You ready? Hope Healing House at gmail.com. That's our email. And once you um, uh, send an email, what will happen is that you'll get an auto response. And then the ministry will respond with the steps to access ministry. And once you complete your inquiry forms, you will be assigned to a team of women who will minister to you and your issue. Women minister to women. Men minister to men. Couples minister to couples. So if you and your husband want to go through ministry about an issue, um, you can do that, but you'll receive ministry separately because Restoring the Foundations and Hope Healing House is not a marriage ministry. However, comma, we have seen incredible results in marriages where couples receive ministry. Amen? Okay, we're going to do a popcorn closing prayer. (laughs) I'm going to start off, and I'm going to ask you to close. Will you be the middle? (laughs) Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you, Lord, that you are the revealer of truth. And that you love us so much, you have more for us. And so, Lord, we thank you that today you're opening our eyes to your vision for us for more. And you're calling us up higher and you're calling us into a greater dimension of freedom. And for that, we say thank you. Thank you for loving us so much that you have more than we could ever imagine even for ourselves. And thank you for making it accessible to us and making ministry available to us that we might live out our God potential, the potential that you put inside of us from the foundation of the earth. God, we just say thank you. Thank you for your restoration grace and thank you for the finished work on Calvary that makes all of this possible. Thank you, Jesus. And Father, we are so grateful. We're so grateful that what you are revealing is what you indeed are healing in us. And Father, even though we don't always know ourselves, you're so intimately aware of what makes us us. And it's your desire, Lord God, for truth to be in our inward parts. So we, Lord God, open ourselves to you, trusting you, Lord, trusting the one who has held us all our lives. Lord God, we believe that we are entering into a new stage and a new place where we truly have come to know and believe the love that you have for us. And in that, we are open to you, taking us further into our healing, into our freedom, and giving us hope Lord God, and using us in this world in the way you designed us. We thank you for that, thanking you that our destiny is living and growing. In Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for every woman of God that you have strategically placed in this room today, Lord God. You know each of them by name, Lord God. 
You love them. You know everything that there is to know about them, Father God, and you, yet you still love them, loved us, Father. Lord God, I pray that they would sense that love, no, no condemnation. We bind the spirit that will come with backlash of any kind, and we command you to go. We declare that you have no authority. Father, we thank you, Lord God, for covering them, Lord God, with your blood, Father. We thank you, Lord God, that hope will arise in them in places where it hasn't been, that they will know, Lord God, that they, there is hope in you, Lord God. You, you've provided a way for freedom for them, Lord God. And Father, we thank you, Lord God, that they would they will know, God, that that the ministry here holds their 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 confidences, their the things that they are concerned about close to our hearts. And God, this is a safe place for them, Father God. Father, we thank you for your freedom, the freedom that you desire for them so much that you gave your son Jesus Christ for their lives, Father God. And Father, we thank you, Lord God, that you have a purpose and a plan for them, Lord God. And Father, their freedom, Lord God, will open up a level of of light into their lives that they will walk in as they never have before, Lord God. I just thank you, Lord God, for just boldness to receive what you've already laid out for each of them, Father. And we bless you and we praise you for the victory that you so generously made available th to us through your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Are there any Hope Healing House mi uh, ministers in the uh, I see Andrea. Is Valerie still here? Okay. Well, you can talk to us and you can talk to Andrea or Valerie or Uma. But God bless you. And thank you for being a part of the 2023 Women of Virtue Train Our Hands to War Conference. We love you guys. Feel free to take pictures.